to play until his mid-40s. He was also asked about his state of mind after all the reported tension with Bill Belichick. Let's take a listen. Do you feel appreciated by them, and do they have the appropriate gratitude for what you have achieved? I plead the fifth. <laughs> 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 Look, I, <laughs> man, that is a tough question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, you know, they, they, your wife, your wife seems to indicate. Yeah. I think everybody in general wants to be appreciated more at work. Are you happy? Uh, I have my moments. <laughs> We're joined by Fox and the analyst Greg Jennings. Welcome, Greg. Good morning. Good morning. What was your takeaway from Brady's comments? It is what it is. Uh, he pleads the fifth. He pleads the fifth because they don't talk in New England. This is the extent of their dialogue. Okay, oh, talk closer. If we miss he, he, yeah, he's talking, but they're not. It's just like Belichick. Belichick will say nothing, but he's saying everything and saying nothing. This is, I don't care in what relationship, family, marriage, like you're going to have disagreements, you're going to have conflicts, you're going to agree to disagree, and you're going to not feel appreciated at times, or like you're the priority at times, but you deal with it. You learn to coexist, you learn to move past it, and that's what they've been able to do. That's what they will continue to do. Belichick, at when everyone gets together this offseason and training camp starts and he has his guys and he's dwindling down, I guarantee you he's going to address everything that we're talking about right now. If you guys aren't on board, you let me know. And the door is that way. Bottom line, and Tom Brady will sit there and he will not say anything and it will be done. Because winning football games will take precedent. Yes, is he irritated? Is he bothered? Is does he is he one hundred percent happy? Absolutely not. But you tell me one person that's one hundred percent happy. You show me one person that's one hundred percent happy. No one. I'm looking at I'm looking at a little different than you are, Greg. Put it like this. Okay, you say the marriage. Let's put this in a marriage. Say a couple have been married 15 years, they got a couple kids. And one comes to the other and says, you know what? I'm ready to move on without you. How do you think that person's going to feel? Because that's what this is about. This is about Tom Brady, what he all accomplished, what they did together. Coach Belichick was willing to move on without him. See, that's what the underappreciation, because if you would ask them, Ask him that very question before this year and before Seth Wickersham's article came out that Mr. Kraft ordered Coach Belichick to trade Jimmy Garoppolo to clear the deck for Tom Brady. Had you asked him before that all came came about, I guarantee you Tom Brady would have said okay. Because guess what they did? Before he got suspended, they gave him a $20 million signing bonus. Gave him a $1 million base salary so the NFL could only get four checks of that million dollars as opposed to the big money. So he would have said, oh, yeah, they appreciate me. Now he said, well, they asked him a question. Does Coach Belichick owe the fans an explanation? Well, you would have to ask the guy. You know what they got to say? The guy who owns the team. You would have to ask the guy who owns the team. They didn't ask him was Coach Belichick tough to play for. He volunteered that. Ain't nobody asked you, Greg, what it's like in your marriage. You volunteer you having problems. You know what I'm saying? So if you volunteer information, oh, so you will go home, your wife will be looking at old Greg, huh? Yeah, I, I hear you. I, don't give me, don't misunderstand me. I, I get it because I was in a relationship with Green Bay and I felt like they didn't appreciate me. Right? We all experienced this. And you said it. You brought it. Absolutely. <laughs> I did. I did, and I think when it comes to Tom Brady, I think he feels appreciated, but now, like to your point, he now has things that have transpired to where he's like, do they really appreciate me? But he never he thought about appreciated, it. but he doesn't feel appreciated. Now. Yes, but, but Skip, like, this happens every single day in the NFL. Tom, how long has Tom Brady been there? He's been there for the entire run. So he's seen player come and go. Great players come and go. He never, it, it never impacted never him. Never thought then. it would happen to him. That's, that's, that's the problem. The that's the issue. Everybody never thinks it'll happen to them. Brett Favre never thought it would happen to him. You ask him, did the Green Bay Packers appreciate him? He yeah, would right. say yes at one point, but then what, what transpired? It's like, well, maybe they don't. 
Greg Jennings, as good as you were, with all due respect to your career, and you did make Aaron Rodgers, you won him a Super Bowl, <laughs> but you, you, you played at a very high level, but you were not this guy. No. This is the greatest quarterback in the history of this league. This is five Super Bowl rings and eight Super Bowl appearances, and the reigning MVP who set the all-time playoff game record in the last Super Bowl was 505 yards passing. And just for the record, I just heard by a text from a very close friend of Tom Brady's who said he was shocked at what Tom said by Tom's standards yesterday. Again, he went from, aw shucks, gee whiz, to drop that mic. He was holding that mic and he might as well have dropped it by his standards because he does not speak like this. This is Tom Brady going LeVar Ball on Bill Belichick. That's how strong it was in the context of who was speaking because he had clearly thought it through. And the, the first line is, do you feel appreciated by the organization? Do you get the appropriate gratitude from the organization? That's the head coach and the owner. And he had thought it through enough to say, I plead the fifth in that that was his cadence. He had thought, he hit every word. I plead the fifth, meaning I cannot speak the truth without incriminating myself. <laughs> That's Tom Brady speaking? And then, are you happy? It's a pretty simple question. Place for a team that is, is as we speak, it's still the Las Vegas betting favorite. Right. Win it all next mm -hmm. year. I have my moments. You have your moments? It has come to that? That you have all this going for you? And now you've announced again, I want to play into my mid-40s. Are you happy? I, I have my moments. And then the Malcolm Butler that you alluded to. This is this is shocking by Brady standards. That he says that Malcolm Butler kept coming over to him during the Super Bowl mm -hmm. saying, TB, like, what's going on here? You're the quarterback of a team favored to win the Super Bowl. And while you're... Your defense is supposed to be on the field. One of the best defenders that you have keeps coming over to you saying, TB, what's up? And you're trying to sit with Josh McDaniels and go over the, the pictures and your strategy for the next series. And you're saying, well, what is going on? And finally, Brady said, I, I kept going as in saying out loud, what defense are we in where Malcolm is not on the field? Is it short yardage or goal line? Because it's almost like a sarcastic line. Why isn't he on the field? Wouldn't that be a little distracting? Yes. If you're the leader of the team, even though you don't play defense and that shouldn't be your your domain or right. your, your father during the game. And yet, it, it was as if Malcolm Butler wanted Tom to walk over right. to Bill Belichick and just say, Coach, why what? isn't he in the game? They're scoring at will on our defense. They're about to put up 41 points. That is we, their backup yeah, coach. And with the backup quarterback. And we've gone to our our dime package, which is, you know, six defensive Absolutely. backs. And you don't have Malcolm Butler on there? Yeah. Really? But Jim Brady didn't ask him that. Tom Brady volunteered. He did. He volunteered. Malcolm Butler was coming to him on the sideline. Because it's all, still, when I was a little kid, my aunts, they were afraid to ask my grandfather something. They would push me up to do it because he was less likely to tell me no. That's true. So they say, hey, go ask, go ask yeah. daddy, can we go such and such? Okay, right. we can do this. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Butler, because he knew he couldn't approach Coach Belichick, yeah. he was trying to get Tom Brady to go ask him, can he get in the game? Why isn't he playing? Yeah. So that's why he kept coming back. And Tom like, I got bigger friends. I want you in the game. But I'm not going to go ask him that. And plus, I got bigger things. I got things I got to worry about. I got to make sure my offense is intact. Yeah. Skip, he could have easily. And for him, like like Skip said, for him, this is a rant. Because he doesn't want to come out this devish. He's spent 19 years building this reputation. Well, all golly gee whiz, I'm Tom. Mm -hmm. and, but for him to say what he said, he said in a joking matter, like, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, 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 I think yeah, yeah, Coach yeah, Belichick yeah. is going to try to yeah, get rid of me yeah, yeah. after everything that, I've that's done. That's exactly the Tony. <laughs> I agree with both of you. I, I believe this is a this is this is far beyond what we would have ever expected Tom Brady to be doing and saying. But if it really was a do or die situation, if it was really choose me, you think Tom Brady's going to say, "Well, let me go." And I'll go. I'll continue playing somewhere else. Is it that serious? No. So what I'm saying is, come the season, regardless of what has transpired, he's going to swallow that pride. Oh yeah. 
and he's going to play ball. Okay, that's what they've always out. done. But if the head coach had had his way, the head coach was going to tell him, thank you, see you later. Absolutely. Right? I, yeah. I understand yeah. that because that's what Bill Belichick, he's the He's the one constant in all of this. Mm -hmm. Like, Bill Belichick is always going to be the one constant. I'm good. This is the way I do things. There's no, there's no give. There's, mm -hmm. there's no give. I don't owe any, there's, I guarantee we will never hear an explanation about the Malcolm Butler. No, we will never hear. You talk about Brady will, after he's done and playing, maybe in a book, right. maybe after sitting down away from the game, he may share what his real sentiments are. But Belichick, even far after, he will never say anything. Mm. That's just who he is. Okay, so the, the final line, Jim Gray asked Tom Brady, if Patriots fans deserve an explanation for why Malcolm Butler didn't play. And Tom says, I don't know. That's probably a better answer for the guy who owns the team. This is the guy who's his father figure, the guy he calls R.K., Robert Kraft. And now it, it's degenerated to, you'll have to ask the guy? Really? So now it, he feels like both the owner and the coach are against him and not appreciate. I, I don't. I don't look at it like. I mean, people, we we take things sometimes out of context. I mean, he just he said the guy. I, I don't believe that there is a problem with Tom Brady and Robert Kraft because Robert Kraft. But was the last a year ago, he would have said, "You'll have to ask Mr. Kraft." The guy. Yeah. You know what rubs Tom Brady is that you know this. You play with a Brett. You play with Aaron. And the coaches that you had, they treat all you guys fair, but they treat those guys different. There's the absolute. Tom Brady has never gotten different different treatment from any other guy from Coach Belichick, and he's like, "Why? We've never had a conversation that didn't involve football. Why? I can't talk to you on any other level except player coach." And you're like, I've won, "I've won five Super Bowls. I've been the ultimate soldier because everything that they're allowed to do in New England it starts with Tom Brady because if he walks the straight and narrow." Everybody has a ball in line behind him. But he is number one behind Coach Belichick. And then everybody just gets the line. 50, mm -hmm. from, 50, from 1 to 56, or 53. Mm -hmm. And so now he's looking at like, hold on. I've been loyal to you beyond loyal for 18 years. And you tried to over what I've done. That's not good enough. Coach Belichick says, I must keep a safe distance mm -hmm. from all my players. Because either I'm going to cut you, or I'm going to trade you, yeah. or you will retire. And that makes it a lot easier if I'm not buddy-buddy with you. You know, some guys get released, you're like, okay, cool. But if it's a friend of yours, you're like, damn, man. I Absolutely. <laughs> so, Tom was like, he saw William McGinnis go out the door. He saw Richard Seymour get traded. They cut to, uh, Lawyer Malloy Tuesday. They playing a the game on Sunday. But he never thought it would happen to him. And Coach Belichick said, yeah, you know what? You want to, I know you will decline eventually, but you won't decline on my watch. You'll decline on someone else because I'm going to get rid of you a year too early. So Tom Brady just redrew the line in the sand. I'm playing until I'm in my middle 40s. What is that, three, four more years? And coach. Least, coach. Yeah, I, and, and I think that is going to cause yeah. some problems in his personal life then uh, because now it's, it's, getting, it's becoming a little too personal. But I, would, I just want to ask you, Shannon, you – have you ever had something transpire, mm -hmm. conduct detrimental to the team, mm -hmm. something with a player mm -hmm. or a coach, doesn't matter, somebody within the organization, and you guys not be given an explanation? I mean, <sighs> ever. Like, norm I mean, normally you know things. Uh, but no, yes and no. Have you, ne have you ever not known why? I, I don't know if I've ever been in a seen a situation like this. Because normally, you know, if a guy's not going to start, say a guy shows up late for something, you know why? He's right. You know, he's not, he's not going to start. And, and as a leader of two Super Bowl teams, the, the coach is going to make yes. you aware. Yes. As yes. A leader. Exactly. Right. I don't. I don't know if, if they have one of those. I don't know if they have a council in New England where the coach is. Well, also, one I don't game. know if they have an explanation that can be shared because maybe it's just that Belichick wanted to do it his way and it backfired. So that can't be the explanation. That is the biggest. I believe that is the biggest issue. He messed. With my Super Bowl yeah. Yeah. championship yeah. opportunity, like that, you know, is get huge. that back. Yep. Great, thanks for joining. What business have you in the Ninja Garden? Is that a red turtle shell on back back? Whoa! She let her hair down. If you were looking for trouble, you found it. I'm not looking for trouble. I'm looking for my book. Ah! Ah! 
If it's a battle you seek, it's a battle you'll get. New show, Craig of the Creek, on Cartoon Network. Watch it now on the Cartoon Network app and on demand. I'm just asking to see more. That's sure. Opportunity like that. You don't get that match. Craig, thanks for joining us. Jason Wynn is reportedly choosing between returning to the Cowboys and a job in television. He was offered a job in the Monday Night Football booth, but Jason Garrett is reportedly trying to persuade Wynn to play another season. A final decision is expected by tomorrow. Shannon, what should Wynn do? Is this a for real question, Skip? Yep, it is. Man, if he don't take that Monday Night job. There's only one. There's only one Monday night game. What well, uh, opening week there's two, but there's only one Monday night game. Skip that 32 tight ends, starting tight ends. Most teams have two, so 64. Some teams have three, so 78 on average. Mm -hmm. Skip, do you actually think? And I get it, Jason. What look at what he's accomplished, and he doesn't have a championship. But there's been a lot of great players that retired and didn't have a championship. And it shouldn't be that every great player wins a championship. Because what's the point in that? If every great player that came along won a championship, there's no point in that, Skip. But look, Frank Gifford had a Monday night gig for 27 years. Dan Dirtle for 12 years. Dandy Don Meredith, 12 years. Do you actually think that Jason Witten is going to play, so let's just say for the sake of argument, three more years? Jason, you get too old to play football. You don't get too old to talk. And I know, Skip, I know, and, and for me, I was in a very similar situation. I wanted to play 15 years. Because once, once you get to 10, you start taking it one at a time. I finished 14. I felt good. I was training as if I was coming back to play 15 years. CBS called me. I went to the interview. I'm stuck on 14, Joy. I'm leaving it there, Skip. That's what I, I was stuck on 14. Now, I, I was in a different situation, Skip. I had three Super Bowls. But at that point, my thinking wasn't I had three Super Bowls. My thinking was, what could I do in year 15 that was going to change the perception of who they thought Shannon Sharp was? What can Jason Witten do in year 16 that's going to change what you, how you view Jason Witten? Either you like what he's done, you believe he was a great tight end, or you don't. Coming back for one more year and possibly, and no guarantee, you're playing for the Patriots, I'm like, hey, you got a real good chance. You got a 90, 85, 90 percent chance for the Super Bowl. But, Man, you better take this job. Mm. So, this topic popped up in the middle of another topic yesterday, this issue of stay or go for Jason Witten. And I agreed with you on the fly, but I was looking at it from a TV perspective. These jobs just don't pop open no. every other day. You better take it while it's off. Yes. That's where Tony Romo was a year ago. And he sees the opportunity and he ran with it. And he, go pro he might be there for 20 years. He might be. So, it's interesting to me that you played this man's position or he plays your position. Mm -hmm. And so you can really relate to the fact that he does love playing football. So I look back at his remarks that night after they played their final regular season game. And he was very adamant about how he felt about coming back for several more years. And he said, oh, I'm back. I love playing this game too much and I know that I can play it at a high level. The burn is strong inside me to play at a high level and to be part of this group of guys and to see it through. Okay, that Those words would not have come out of Shannon Sharp's mouth at the very end because you were getting close to being done with the process required to get to the football field yep. on Sunday afternoon, right? Yep. Because it's hard. Yeah. And I've been watching this all or nothing docu series on the Cowboys from last year that's on Amazon. I've actually sped through all, I think there's six of them. I can't remember. Maybe I'm confusing with Tom, Tom versus Tom, but I think there are six actually. But I watched the final one. And in the final team meeting that day after the last game, the, the day after, they presented Jason with a gold football. Jason Garrett presented Jason Witt with a gold football, thanking him for 15 years. It's a long time to play at a high level. 
for being the leader of that team for 15 years. And he gave a, what turned into a tearful speech to the whole team. And yet, not one time did he say, I'm done. He, he was going forward. Right. He just was appreciating the, the opportunity he had to be with this group of guys going into next year. So it wasn't a retirement ceremony. Right. It was a thank you for all that you've done. It's kind of what Tom Brady would yeah. like to have happened. Have, 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 <laughs> so my, my question back to you is, once you walk out the door on this, you can't get it back. You can't go to the booth for a year and then say, you know what, I think I'm going to go back because the odds are you won't be able to get back to that level. Yeah, but, and the odds are this booth job won't be available. Okay, I agree with you, but... This is hard on me because I'm looking at it from a TV perspective, but I'm trying to look at it through the eyes of a guy who loves playing football. Yeah. If you do, you should play it as long as you can because at some point you definitely won't be able to play it anymore. So what is your plan after you're done playing football? I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I, here's the other thing that was different between you two. Do you realize Jason Garrett's missed one game in his whole career? One game? Back in his rookie yeah. year, he got his jaw broken, had to have three plates put in, mm -hmm. and he missed one game with a broken jaw, but yeah. came right back and kept playing after surgery on his jaw. And since then, you were talking about blessed. That's pretty blessed, wouldn't yeah. you say? Uh, yeah, and that, whatever you want to call it, lucky or what, whatever. I mean, you, I mean, to play that those collisions that you're involved in and to play the length of time that he's played and to come up and to be out there and be available every single week. Yeah. And as you know, he is a blocker. Yeah. He's almost like another tackle yes. for them. And, and he, he blocked more now than he did because, yeah. you know, he can't get down the field like he was. Yeah. But Skip, this is, for me, this is a no-brainer because this is such a, a you Think about how many guys have actually had this Monday night job, Skip. Yeah. Not very many. And they normally keep it for an extended period of time. Normally. This is 10, you could have this job for 10, 15 years because he's, what, 35 36 years of age. So if you do this job for 15 years, you're still only 51. Okay, what if he winds up not loving being in the Monday Night Football booth or whichever booth he chooses? What if he lo what, what if he just loves football so much that it just tears his guts out that he's not down there playing on the game he's commenting on? Well, Skip, I think he's... Look, for me, if if, if, if he's playing for a championship... That's not, if he wins a championship, that's not going to change my perception no. of how I view Jason Witt. You know what? I don't even get that from him watching this docuseries. I'm, I'm not sure it's about winning a championship. I think he just loves getting up. That They have the camera in his car at 530, and he's backing out of his driveway. And he is eating it up, man. He can't wait. I mean, I love him. I, 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 and I was, I was ready to come back. For, I had said my say, 15, this is going to be it, Skip. I'm done. I'm out. I want to make sure I'm in the best shape of my life. And I was where I wanted to be. I was like a couple of pounds under where I normally weigh at the time of that time right. of the year. So I'm like, I'm primed. I'm you know, ready. You know? And I got you told me you were tired of the meeting. The meetings, I was done. Okay. I was doing the meeting. Right. And, and I, I think that Mike would have been willing to make some concessions, especially in training camp. Now, obviously, the uh, 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 the once the season starts, yeah. you know, I, I would not. I mean, maybe my maybe my individual meeting, I'd have skipped out on a few of those. But the team meeting, oh. I would have been there. Yeah, but Skip, this for me, and 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 if it's being reported, the money that's involved, man, please. Ugh. Everything doesn't make everybody happy. No. Nope. When we talk about Monday Night Football, it's very easy for us to be like, "Hello, Monday Night Football." You're not going to get that opportunity again. They're going to put someone else in there who's likely going to be there for a long time. But he's made over seventy-two million in his career. He's and who knows? Maybe he wants to. Wait, how much? Over seventy-two million. And I, hey, by the way, he is beloved in Cowboy yeah. Nation, so he will have a second and career doing whatever, whatever he wants. And, that, and that's the thing. Maybe he wants yeah. to spend time with his family. Maybe he doesn't want to work. You know. I mean, it's only twenty weeks out of the year. He ain't got to run no more. I mean, he ain't got to worry about me. But you can't replace the position that you have in football. You have nothing else. If he nothing stays in there, you gonna have to race me. Then what happens, Joy? And you tear your hamstring off the bone. I mean, I don't want to race. You're going to be hobbling in here. We're going to have to pick you up and put you in the I, chair. I, I, I ain't gonna It'll have be to, very embarrassing. I ain't going to have to exert that much to beat him. Mm. I don't want to What? What's the drama? What's the suspense in me out running another retired guy? That's why I want to race ED. It ain't no fun in beating ED. He retired. I, I want to race somebody that's current. I don't even understand it. 
Jason Witten, you go back and play, you have to race. Do it, make it happen. Hey everyone, Joy Taylor here, and before the show moves along, I want to tell you about an exciting new show. It's called the Fox Sports Daily Brief, available only on Facebook Watch. We all know everyone is busy, but the Fox Sports Daily Brief takes the biggest stories in the world of sports and delivers them to you in one video on Facebook. It's all you need to know about sports and the biggest stars at Fox Sports. So log on to Facebook and search Fox Sports Daily Brief and look for new episodes weekdays. Now back to the show. Baker Mayfield was drafted number one overall by the Browns, but apparently he was almost a Patriot. Baker's agent Jack Mills dropped a bombshell that there was a real chance New England would have traded up to the number two pick and taken Baker. Mills said the Patriots told him, quote, you may get a big surprise on draft day at number two if he's available. Skip, what's your reaction? Uh -huh. Stop the presses, hold the phone, I take it all back. Because I gave Belichick a pass <laughs> and his pop. I gave him pop for staying home at 23 and 31 in the first round and giving Tom Brady some help and not using that draft ammo because he also had two twos mm -hmm. to go up and get one of the top quarterbacks. Uh, hold the phone because he wanted, like a lot of teams, Baker Mayfield, and the only place he could get him was at two. So you might say the Cleveland Browns saved Tom Brady yep. because if Belichick goes and gets Baker Mayfield, we're right back to square one. Tom Brady quits. Well, he's, 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 <laughs> you know, it's going to be close because he would clearly then be back on the fast track out yes. the back door Absolutely. at the end of next year, right? Absolutely. And he would be on the fast track back to a team in which he would have been given no new help from the right. draft. Correct. There would be no Isaiah Wynn, a new offensive lineman. There would be no Sony Michelle, who could be, I don't know, the offensive rookie of the year next year. He's got a chance. Right. So those would be non-existent because it would be Baker Mayfield, and you want to talk about somebody who'd come in gunning for the job, he would pull no punches. He'd say, I respect Tom Brady, but he would want that job. He would be campaigning, get me on the field. Even though this is the greatest quarterback ever, Baker Mayfield is hes pretty full of himself. You know, so Skip, here I, it would come. Skip, I was, I was, I was going to go into this talking about, okay, um, Mary Kay Cabot, I have the most respect for her, and she's like six or twelve teams, but she doesn't name any. Are these teams? Do these teams need quarterback? Saying that six or twelve that she surveyed, right. they wanted Baker Mayfield, right? I was like, uh, and I was going to say, are the Patriots or are the uh, the Packers or the Saints or the are these? Is she talking? But now I don't even care. This is all I want to talk about the Patriots. Mm -hmm. They coach Belichick like, if I could move up. I'm going to package all the skip. It's basically I'm selling all my possessions. He would. And I think he that. would take both those ones and, and maybe two. both. The yes. Apple up to, to go for 23? Yeah, absolutely. Because they were later first. Yeah. 23 and 31. Right. Right. Because you know? uh, what you call them moved up 10 spots? Uh, 17 spots. Kansas City. Kansas City. Moved up 17 yeah. spots. 20. Home. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, you'd have, you're going to have to package both of those to move up because they ended up giving up this year's first round pick. Ooh, skip out. Tom Brady. Oh, Tom Brady. Jim, come do another interview. Because I didn't know I this. Know. I didn't know this at the well, time. Because had I known this at the time. Yeah, this will be a bombshell oh, for yeah. Tom Brady. Oh, yeah. I would have went, went epic random. Uh -huh. I, ooh, I wish. <clears throat> skip, I wish I could be a flower on the wall in, uh -huh. in Brookline. I yep. know where Tom Brady lived at, at a country club. I wish I could be on the flower on the wall when he's talking to Giselle. Uh -huh. No good. He's throwing some avocados. Yeah, he probably said that. No good dirty. <laughs> Shucks, G Wiz, good guy Tom Brady. We saw no. Tom versus Tom. He, he can curse a little bit. Yeah, he like, I'm, done with I'm taking the gloves off. Coach Belichick, you low down dirty. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. I can't believe you after all these years. Yeah. 18 years I was loyal to you. Five Super Bowls, eight Super Bowl appearances. And this is the gratitude, you know what? Let me tell you what. I've been knowing all along. He's been cheating, y'all. Let me tell you how he did spy game. <laughs> I'm telling everything, Skip, baby. I'm a <laughs> Skip, oh, Skip. So, back to Mary Kay Cabot's survey yeah. that a bunch of these top teams wanted Baker Mayfield. Right. I'm not surprised because I kept telling you, I'm just going on the eye test. Right. Baker Mayfield, to me, was way better on the football field than all these other top quarterbacks in performance. But I can't defend the red flag. Does that say more about Baker? Or does that say less about the talent that he's up against in the quarterback position? Because remember that he's the only he's the only true senior. Everybody else is a red shirt sophomore, the red shirt junior. So is that case. more about him or 
less about them. Or is it a case of every year, Mel Kuyper, Todd McShea at ESPN, they set the tone for who we all think right. we're supposed to be at the top yeah. of the draft. And I think Mel had Josh, Josh Allen the whole way, yep. number one, yep. overall just rank, mm -hmm. not mock draft, but just rank, right. right? So the point is, they set the tone, but it isn't always the truth of how the rest of the team see this. Right. And I think the more they looked at the tape, listen, Baker Mayfield, I keep deadly accurate right. thrower of the football with with enough arm. He's, he's got an above average arm. Yeah. So it's not, he, his arm's probably, it might be even a little stronger than Tom Brady's. Now that we've seen with Tom Brady and Joe Montana, you don't have to have a rifle Correct. to do this. You have to just throw it right. accurately and on time. But I would think, Skip, that Todd and Mel would actually talk, they would talk, at, at some point they start talking to uh, uh, NFL personnel yep. to get a clear picture of who's going to go what, when and where. And they stood very firm that uh, I, I think Mel with Josh Allen and I think uh, 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 Todd McShay was uh, Sam Donald. Mm -hmm. So I think they, they were, were they yep. were very clear yep. on what direction they thought one of these two guys would be number one. Every, and everybody that I saw, Skip, had Baker Mayfield at best at one two, I think I saw one time he was third, but everybody basically had him in that fourth slot. Well, well, before last football season, he, he was like a third or fourth round pick, and right. then he goes all the way, vaults to number one number overall. One. Because these coaches, the old school coaches, look at the crotch grab or the trash talk. They love that. that that's that's, 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 that's It is a Tuesday. It is May 1st. May Day. Steve knows that. May Day. Yep. We have Steve O uh, from the Aggressive Progressives, you know, OG around here at the Young Turks. Maz Jabrani is here. Maz, where can people find more stuff from you? Uh, you they can find me on Twitter, at Maz Jabrani, uh, Instagram, at Maz Jabrani, MazJabrani.com for shows, as well as my Netflix special, Immigrant. So I got, you can find me in many ways. Oh. So I, I, I had the privilege of seeing Maz in person uh, not too long ago. Stand up routine. It was it was a, it was a short set, like maybe like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, outstanding. I was I was in tears from laughing so hard. It was such good stuff. I'm good for 10 so, minutes, people. <laughs> <laughs> Watch Immigrant on Netflix. Watch it. Awesome. When did it come out? Yeah. Is it now? now? It's out. It's out on there right now. I got actually I have, uh, that was my first Netflix original, and then I had a couple other uh, uh, specials that were Showtime specials that are on Netflix. So people cannot miss me. I'm on YouTube. I got my own channel. I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to uh, diversify, you know? That's great. It's yeah. fantastic. I've seen you on this show before, um, and you're always awesome. Uh, something else, you guys can tune in to Jake Uger, who is from uh, The Young Turks, this show. Uh, don't miss him on Comedy Central tomorrow. He's on The Opposition with Jordan Klepper. Tune in at 1130 Eastern Time on Comedy Central. Um, and I think it also is at Pacific Time. They do those three-hour blocks. Wednesday, May 2nd, tomorrow, uh, 2018. Yeah, uh, Jordan Klepper is really funny, really good. Uh, also does a uh, former Daily Show person, has his own show on Comedy Central. Check it out. We have a full show show for you today. We're going to talk about Israel and Iran. We're going to talk about uh, the caravan of migrants making their way from Mexico, from Central Central America, actually, all the way through Mexico, and they are have arrived in America. We'll show you what's happened to them since they have gotten here um, to the border. Also, it's May Day which is International Workers Day. We'll talk about the various marches and protests that are happening and uh, have happened across the United States. Also, there was a raid of another Trump associate, but you'll never guess who did the raiding. It is an amazing story. Also, it's not just Trump who has amazing hair in this story. Um, and hopefully we have time uh, to talk about this, uh, what Trump did not talk about when he went to Michigan the other day. But first, we'll talk about the story that is uh, at the top of everyone's mind right now, the questions. So many questions were leaked that uh, Robert Mueller, the special counsel who was investigating collusion, obstruction of justice, all of the above, 
uh, surrounding the Donald Trump scandals. Uh, he submitted ostensibly 49 different questions uh, that Donald Trump might have to answer should he submit to actually talking to the special counsel. Um, they ended up in the hands of the New York Times. We're not sure exactly how they got there, who leaked them, how they leaked them. This is kind of a contentious issue. But I'm going to give you an example, uh, a few examples of the kinds of questions that were asked. Uh, they re uh, revolved around Flynn, Comey, Jeff Sessions, uh, and then also just like a bunch of questions that are on everybody's mind. It really covered everything. On Jeff Sessions, here's a sample of a couple questions. Uh, what did you think and do regarding the recusal of Mr. Sessions? What efforts did you make to try to get him to change his mind? Did you discuss whether Mr. Sessions would protect you and reference past attorneys general? Uh, on Flynn, the questions were, what did you know about phone calls that Mr. Flynn made with the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kislyak, in late December, uh, all the way to how was the decision made to fire Flynn on February 13th, 2017? And then just like the stuff you've been wondering about, things like, what was the purpose of your May 2017 tweet? Um, just like a random tweet, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Pick a tweet. If they're kind of asking about whether he should be held responsible, it kind of seems for the things he puts uh, out in social media. And then also things like, what did you mean in your interview with Lester Holt was the other question on that graphic. Uh, what do you guys think about these questions? Was there anything that jumped out to you about the questions or what? No, uh, these are the questions that are, are on everyone's minds who are following uh, this case. Mm -hmm. uh, so nothing jumped out uh, in my mind. I was actually a little bit uh, surprised at, um, or I guess I'm not that surprised at how open-ended the questions are. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what were you thinking? How did you feel? You know, you know, why did you do this? There were no uh, specific questions that required a particular answer. They're all kind of broad-based questions. And uh, to me, uh, that's... Because you know, as a prosecutor, you would ask that you would ask, uh, I guess, broad-based questions. If you're just kind of fishing or trying to explore as many facts as possible. You're not trying to uh, cross-examine him and nail him to a certain answer necessarily uh, by asking him very direct questions. Let's just, just try. Yeah, you know that that, brings, that that's funny. I, never, I didn't think about it like that. About you're right. How did you feel? What were you thinking? It's it's maybe it's it's like a a forced therapy session. You know, like. <laughs> How do you feel when you're doing those <laughs> tweets? How do you feel about that? Wouldn't that be great if like Donald Trump came out and goes, I was, I, I did the interview and I'm, I'm a changed man. Yeah. I'm going to stop tweeting. And uh, it was, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a therapy that session was, in disguise. It was the that moment when Trump started yeah. crying when yeah. he realized, yeah. ah, I've just been repressing so much. Thank you, Robert Mueller. <laughs> what were you thinking? Yeah. Uh, I, don't know. I was wrong. Robert Mullen. Mueller is a fantastic person. Yeah. Giant mind. The biggest mind ever. He's wonderful. <laughs> you know what's crazy for me is when I see this, it's crazy because now I guess Trump is saying that it was that he didn't leak it, that his people didn't leak it, and we were trying to figure out who leaked it. It's this rabbit hole that anytime something happens, we just go deeper. Now we're arguing about who leaked the questions. Right. And it's like, uh, listen, the questions are there, and, and the only explanation that I've heard so far that makes some sense is that it was <laughs> that his people have leaked it to because they know he watches TV and they're trying to encourage him not to go. Exactly. We have a video of an interview that someone who used to work for Robert Mueller, um, it's the first video in our graphics, um, but yeah, someone who used to work for Robert Mueller, like who does look like a frightened deer in the headlights, I will prime you for that, but he is kind of explaining exactly what Maz was referring to. Uh, let's take a look at that video. It would seem to me potentially that the White House Counsel's Office let this float out into the media in an effort to influence the president's thinking about whether or not to do an interview. And I think that they'll gauge reaction of people to these questions and help influence the president to decide whether he should sit down or not sit down. I think that there's a great debate going on within the White House Counsel's Office about this, and I think this may be one way to try to shape president's thinking about it in addition to the advice that he's getting from his lawyers. Yeah, the previous presidents, you would just sit down with them and say, this is important. Is it that Trump won't take something seriously unless he sees it on television? I, I think that's certainly part of it. I also think that he is, he's, he's not good at taking advice from his people. And the other problem is that he surrounds himself with sycophants who always right. tell, tells him what he wants to hear. If if you're not a sickle fan, then you get fired or you get, you know, uh, cast out in some way. Um, but, but you know, on a separate issue, I'm actually not 
uh, in favor of all of this coverage, to be honest. Why? Um, because when there's an investigation, I want there to be an investigation. And just do the investigation and come back to us when you're done. But the constant speculating by the media and the gossipy, salacious, scandalous nature of it all, to me, is a, is a distraction from a lot of important issues that we should be covering. And now, on top of the distractions, we have a spectacle on top of a spectacle. Because now, as, as Maz pointed out, we have to figure out who leaked it. Was it them? Was it us? Who, you know, what, what was the purpose? So it becomes a circus. And, and when the circus happens, a lot of the important stuff, even this investigation itself, has not taken a back seat to the process of the investigation. But you see, that's what I think he thrives on. Yes. He is P.T. Barnum. Yes. You call it a circus. It is a circus. Yes. I always say he used to have a reality show on one network. Now he's got a reality show on every network, right. including us. Everyone's talking about him, right? Before, when he was just The Apprentice, he would tune in on Wednesday. Maybe the next day, if he says something stupid there, we make fun of it. But now it's 24-7, and he is a master of doing this stuff. The reason he tweets on top of this stuff, we know he's a liar. He, the only way this, this, this actual interrogation, well, there's two ways interrogation works. One is they trip him up, and he just gets really pissed off and just starts, you know, has the... Uh, um, uh, with he a Jack wants Nicholson right. moment, yeah, right? right? You can't handle the truth. <laughs> if that happens, you're goddamn right. I order the cold <laughs> right. yeah, You know, that's one way we get. The other way that, that this that, that we get him is if he does this interview on a lie detector test. Which, by the way, he might pass because he's so good at lying. Right. You know, but he's a sociopath, and so it's uh, it, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a circus, and it keeps going. And it's like you know what? Just zip it up. Do the investigation. But then you know what's discouraging is when you find out, because everyone, everyone who, we, we all know he's lied. Mm -hmm. We all know that he knows there was collusion. Of course there was collusion. He knows if, if every, if Manafort, Kushner, uh, you, you name it, mm -hmm. all around him, they all met with the Russians at some point. So what do you do? Do you just like, when he tweets about this, do you ignore it? Or do you, like there's this instinct I have to call him out. Like I have this graphic, like there's a tweet that he, we don't have to go to it, but I have a graphic set up where he's, there's a tweet where he's like, uh, you know, there's collusion that never existed. There's no questions on collusion. And then I had prepared like six questions about collusion. Like, it's my instinct to say like, all right, Donald Trump, you, you tweeted this. Now, the options I have are one, I can just kind of let it go and just be like, I'm going to ignore it. And I talk to like psychiatrists who are like, what do you do? He's like, they say, if there's bad behavior, just ignore it and it'll stop. But at the same time, like, he still is the president of the United States. He still yeah. has, like, this major role. Am I going to just let it go? Or do I have to say, well, there's a question where it says, what do you know about the 27 meeting in the Seychelles with Eric Prince? What do you know about Ukrainian priest, uh, peace proposal on, with Mr. Cohen on 2017? What knowledge did you have of any outreach by your campaign, including Paul Manafort, to Russia about potential uh, assistance to the campaign? Those are explicit questions about collusion. Because I know on the other side, Trump's fans are all going to see that tweet and be like, you know what? There was no question about collusion. Oh, there's no question about collusion. Right. I've been in conversations with Trump fans who have said, you know what? There's no question. Like, they'll take a bite from a lie he's told and just been like, that's the truth. So, so you're right, Brett. I mean, he is the president of the United States. So you have to cover him. You can't just ignore the guy. And he does foment this kind of energy and, and, and the need for coverage. Um, at the same time, I don't think you're going to convince anyone who's a Trump supporter that he should, that they should stop being a supporter because of this investigation or Russia or collusion. They're, they're have their minds made up that these are all lies and they're already on the side. I think the way to get to those Trump supporters is to show them how they have been tricked by Trump into supporting him because everything that he promised them is not coming to fruition. He didn't bring back 100% of the coal mining job. He hasn't done any for anything for any of the people that actually voted for him. Even the tax has a giant fraud. It goes to all the goes to the, to the, to the wealthy. So, so I think there are many issues that we can cover and focus on if your goal is to uh, to bring Trump down and convince the supporters to stop supporting him, this is the wrong way to go, I think. Because what you're really doing here is dividing people to teams, and they're already on his team. So so they believe his tweets when he says, Mueller's a liar, Mueller's in bed with the, with the, with people who are out to get him, and the media is fake. They, they already believe that, so I don't think arguing with them on Twitter and calling them out, as you say, really helps, helps that much. But that's my take on it. Uh, listen, I think you both have good points. I think, uh, uh, to Brett's point, 
the unfortunate thing is no matter what you say, yeah. his tweet with his followers is going to take precedence over whatever your arguments are, whatever right. your arguments are, yeah. the whole thing, even even logic. Mm -hmm. And so two things. First of all, just for your own health, I, I bet you if, if they did an analysis of the level of anxiety in this country, it's skyrocketed since this guy came in because yes. we all, like you just said, when I see a tweet from him, my instinct is this, one, I'm going to get <laughs> I'm ready to go, man. <laughs> But I, but I've, I've tried recently. To, I got kids, and I go. Sometimes I'm sitting there with my phone, and I'm like, "My God, put the phone down and talk to your kids." Like, be in this moment. There's more to life than Donald Trump's tweets. Now, that said, you don't ignore it. You wait till either late at night, or you've had a couple of drinks, and now you go, you go really hardcore at him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, or, or sometimes, like, like a tweet will come in my head. I'm like, "Oh my God, I gotta wake up and send this because it feels so good, right?" I mean, it does. I think there's probably some psychological thing to it. The psychological studies I've seen surrounding like, should I vent or should I just ignore it, right? They are this. One, the venting, the initial vent, an occasional vent is good. Yes. It releases uh, something that you've kind of been repressing, but a consistent venting uh, kind of reinforces yes. the positive that feeling you have after venting and it makes you want to be more negative on a consistent basis and the long term effect of that is it makes you like a depressed angry person not a clinically depressed but like it makes you what conventionally you'd say as depressed but an angrier person yeah it pulls you deep yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally agree with that and you know, the thing is I wish we could have investigations that are actual investigations and not political politically motivated nonsense I think this is a real one. This is a real one. This is a real yeah. one, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm afraid of this becoming a circus too, because all the Benghazi investigations were a joke. It was, I mean, how many investigations do we have? Fifty-seven. What's the right thing to take away from these Mueller questions being leaked, if anything? Well, I, 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 I don't have to take, take away from the leaking of it, but in terms of the questions themselves, yeah. I, I'm happy that he's asking what appears to be the right questions, in my opinion. So, uh, Mueller, go forward. God bless your investigation, and let's see what they uncover. I'm curious to see what they uncover. Um, what I don't like is a media circus surrounding the whole process. Right. Yeah, there's a couple. First of, first of all, the fact that I, one of the questions I think talks about uh, believing, he keeps keep saying Putin said there was no collusion, so I'm going to believe him over my own intelligence. And so, at first you think, oh, maybe it's his ego, because he thinks if Putin helped him win, then that means he didn't really win. But you go deeper, and you go, no, he definitely knows some things were done and it's this deny 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 it reminds me of the eddie murphy joke where he goes when, right when he gets ca caught he goes if your wife catches you having wasn't sex me. with someone else yeah it wasn't me it wasn't me and then, and then and then once you but here's now here's where it turns because his followers i think even if we get stuff that prove that he was guilty mm -hmm. they will listen to he, he can he can yeah. you know pivot so in the in the joke eddie murphy goes yeah baby i effed her but I make love to you. <laughs> right? That's coming. That's coming. There was collusion. Yeah. But I did it for you, baby. I did it for you, yeah. baby. All right. We got to take a break. We got way more show after this, including new developments in the Iran Israel nuclear deal uh, discussion. More after this. Don't go away. My name is Allison Hart. I am a national director with Wolfpack. Pop on those tricky glasses, guys, because <laughs> the goal of Wolfpack is to get an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that will allow us to have free and fair elections. It's not the only issue, but it's the first issue, and that's money in politics. The goal of Wolfpack is to get a representative democracy back in this country. The corruption issue affects every other issue. Uh, you name it. You can go down the list. Education, the environment, the military, the economy. People at the top, that are making the most money, are the ones that are dictating all of the rules. That is the antithesis of a democracy. Wolfpack has the most intelligent, uh, plausible way to get money out of politics. We have the logical plan. So what we're trying to do is to use the power that our forefathers gave us in the U.S. Constitution through Article 5. Article 5 is a specific procedure set up in the Constitution to propose amendments to it. You have to work state by state. We need 34 states to make that happen. Vermont, California, Illinois, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. We've passed in those states so far. One of the hardest parts of my job is that I have to follow her. <laughs> Give me a break. 
My name is Mike Mazzetta. I am a national director of Wolfpack. We have decided to move Wolfpack from defense to offense. We travel from state to state uh, constantly. This year, she was gone from January 2nd until, I think, May, without ever going home once. So, that's dedication. I get frustrated and want to quit every other week. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Kind of. There are definitely really tough moments. But the most amazing thing about it all is that we get through it together and we get stronger because of it and we just keep each other going. Like Mike and I, when I'm down, he like pushes me forward and when he's down, I push him forward and we keep on, we keep on going and work like a team like that. And that's what we call our state teams and that's why they need each other as well because it takes a lot of tenacity and a lot of perseverance and resiliency to be able to get legislation passed, period, let alone to fix corruption in the most powerful country in the world. When we passed in California, that was my first win that I got to personally enjoy. That was amazing. Um, I think I was hooked, <laughs> officially hooked at that point. I was in Rhode Island when we passed. I was probably there every single day that week, just standing outside, holding up signs, waiting for legislators. Two years of really, really hard work condensed into this one amazing moment of victory. To have those moments, it literally makes everything that we do so much more rewarding. If people are truly sick and tired of sitting by and watching what's happening to this country, and if people are truly sick and tired of just talking about it and tweeting about it and liking it and sharing it on Facebook, it's time to take action and get out on the streets and get involved and learn how to get involved even if you don't know how to. You cannot just complain from the sidelines and just say, hey, there is too much going on. We need to do this now. There is no time to waste. Anybody who wants to get involved, is curious, uh, is a little scared, but would like to know how to possibly start uh, learning how to make this happen, should go to wolf-pac.com, wolf-pac.com, and sign up to volunteer. No experience necessary. The facts are on our side. The history is on our side. The public opinion is on our side, both on the policy and the procedure. We're going to find more success, and we will get this amendment. There's no other option for me. Hey, welcome back to the Young Turks, everybody. Brett Ehrlich, Steve-O, Maz Jabrani here with you. Uh, don't forget to uh, hit us up on social media, as they say. Uh, member shout-outs this week go to, or today, go to Daryl Knight and Holly Kent. Uh, new message from Shop TYT, everybody. Lapel pins are not sold out yet. <laughs> go to Shop TYT to get yours now. I'll buy her. one after the show. After the show. After the show. Not during the show. We need your focus. I'll buy it right now. Nope. Steve-O said we have to wait till after, and we will. Um, all right. We'll go to TYT, uh, hashtag TYT Live tweets. Morning, my son said, maybe, just maybe, the questions were leaked as a trick. Maybe it's like when teacher a teacher accidentally leaves an upcoming test in view of students so the cheaters think they know what to study, but the day of the test, it's completely different. Um, tripping up the cheaters. John Negus says, uh, Mark Twain said that it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. Ooh, That's yes. a really good point. That's yeah. exactly the right point. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then Crayfish Daddy... <laughs> Crayfish Caddy says, I don't care about the opinions of Trump fans. The court of public opinion is not a real court. We can have that court. He can have that court. All I care about is a court that actually matters. Incidentally, the court that actually matters in the meantime is being changed by Trump appointments, which are the only successful thing, uh, one of the very few successful things that um, he really has been able to accomplish. All right, we have a lot more show for you. We're going to get right into it. Uh, what's going on with Iran, Israel, etc.? The White House is walking back statements that it made about Iran's nuclear program. Um, it has to do with the tense of a verb. It's been a very intense few hours. Um, it all starts here. Now, in a nationally televised event uh, uh, address, Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel recently uncovered 55,000 documents and 183 CDs of information from Iran's nuclear archive. Just the, the idea that it would imply what's happening now in Iran 
and it was on CDs. <laughs> The big question. Uh, he said there was half a ton of material, uh, is including information about a Project Ahmad that was the code name for a nuclear weapons project. What's the importance of this? Well, when we signed the deal, the deal with Iran, Iran denied ever pursuing nuclear weapons. This seems to imply that uh, Iran was pursuing nuclear weapons, despite what they said. Now, right after that uh, re revelation of information was made by Benjamin Netanyahu, Trump praised um, the presentation that Benjamin uh, made, which, or at least the part of it that he saw, was amazing. He said he's 100% right about Iran. Iran's state-run media had a response saying uh, Netanyahu is famous for ridiculous shows. The semi-official FARS news agency believed to be close to the Revolutionary Guard dismissed Netanyahu's speech as a propaganda show. The implication that Trump, or that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is famous for you know, large displays like this. I have proof that he, that is true at the UN. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, <laughs> this is one of my favorite things. I did a this segment at the time that was like this. The next one was how mad he'd be if Iran actually got a bomb, and it was just Yosemite Sam. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's that's what happened. Someone from the EU, uh, Frederica Federica Mogherini said uh, late Monday in a first reaction that what I have seen from the first reports is that the Prime Minister Netanyahu has not put into question Iran's compliance of the deal. The question being like, it, despite what they did before the deal was signed, are they complying now? The EU's foreign affairs chief, who you just saw the quote from, sees no exact reason to question that. Afterwards, after all that, Sarah Huckabee Sanders released a statement to the press, and it said this. These facts are consistent with what the United States has long known. Iran has, Iran has a robust clandestine nuclear weapons program that it has tried and failed to hide from the world and from its own people. But people pointed out uh, the documents that we saw from Iran were from before the nuclear deal took place. How can you say that it proves that currently... Iran has a nuclear program, especially because the IAEA and various other agencies that are tasked with checking to see if they're in compliance with the nuclear deal, those folks all seem to say, no, they don't have a nuclear deal now. And so the walking back is the White House is quietly walking back, according to the Associated Press. Uh, a ch uh, charge that Iran maintains an active nuclear weapons program saying it really meant that Iran had one before the 2015 nuclear agreement. They said it was a grammatical error. What's going on? Uh, what's going on is the usual suspects trying to foment more uh, war and and um, instability in the Middle East. So, yes, this is exactly what happened, right? So, uh, Netanyahu takes documents that predate the negotiation of the Iran deal and then uses that as some sort of uh, Trojan horse, if you will, to say, see, Iranians can't trust them, they're bad people. But I would argue, and I think the Europeans are arguing, well, that's exactly why we need a deal, right? Because uh, the Iranians are trying to get uh, to a nuclear arms program. So to stave that off, we want to have a deal in place so that they don't get there. Yeah, listen, as an Iranian, uh, I've got to say, never do business with an Iranian. They'll screw you. But anyway, <laughs> uh, no, uh, no. <laughs> never buy a rug from an Iranian. Uh, I'm still paying. I don't know. It was too expensive. Anyway, no. Uh, as a Jew, I'll say, take that up with the anti-defamation. <laughs> listen, I'll tell you a couple of things. You brought up a couple of great points. First of all, the fact that it was on CDs is great. I didn't even think about it. Yeah. I was like, you know, we bought an eight-track tape. So, yeah. <laughs> um, secondly, yeah, you can't just make a statement and then go, oh, great grammatical error. Come on, man. Take responsibility. You can't be like, there was no collusion. Wait, grammatical error. There was collusion. <laughs> uh, we, we put in a no. Um, and uh, and Bibi, first of all, again, with Bibi and the and the the, and the, the, pre the presentation, the bomb. I wonder if right. he's got like a kid that's just like, you know what I'm saying? He's got some kid who's like a graphic designer no one will hire. He'd be like, you will design the, uh, the bomb for me and then we're going to put the thing and I will make a presentation. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and, and Trump would be scared. You know, <laughs> this Iran nuclear deal, I, I look, I, as it, I came to America, late 70s, landed here, um, um, and, uh, and right away the hostage crisis happened. So Iranians have had, uh, in America, we've had a lot of trouble with like, you know, uh, because at the same time, a lot of Iranians, myself included, don't like the leadership in Iran. We're opposed to the regime in Iran. Now, where the, the, the divide comes is there's some Iranians in America who go, 
we want America to attack Iran and somehow get rid of the mullahs and make Iran free and bring back, you know, the great Iran that we all know. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't know how you go to war with Iran in a surgical way where you only get rid of the mullahs and not kill hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Iran innocent Iranians. So then there's the other side, which is the, the side that, 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 promo that, that wants to try diplomacy. And we tried for 40 years. We tried the, you know, uh, the, the fighting each other. And, and with this Iran nuclear deal, I felt it was the first time we're giving diplomacy a chance. And the strategy with the diplomacy is less of the diplomacy so that the Iranian hardliners can't point at America and go, look, yes, they're who's holding us back. Right. And we saw that at the end of the year with the protests that were happening. A lot of those protests were for economic reasons. So if you are able to get rid of America as the great Satan and Iran has to look inside and go, wait a minute, we're just mismanaging our economy. We are stealing from our people, you know, the, the, the leadership. Uh, th then hopefully within Iran there'll be a re revolt, and, and or, or slowly there'll be I should say an evolution, not not a revolution, but where people will die. Anyway, long story short, in my opinion, this is just I I don't know, you know, Trump has not uh, proposed any better options in his talk. He just goes, it's a bad deal, bad deal, bad deal. I'm the art of the deal guy. Right. So, so Musk, I totally agree with you. Uh, nothing benefits the Iranian hardliners more than the great Satan USA and the other smaller Satan Israel teaming up against them, right? That totally consolidates their power. So we're doing a great disservice to Iranian people who want a new leadership. Secondly, this is the same playbook that we used to go to war in Iraq. Yeah. So we dug up old misdeeds or you know old uh, uh, horrors of Saddam Hussein. He gassed his own people. Yeah, he did in the 80s with our assistance when he was on our side against the Iranians, right? So, so, uh, and then you know we have uh, Netanyahu making a comment that, that to me was very reminiscent of Rumsfeld. You know, uh, Bibi says he has. What, what did he say? 100% proof or whatever uh, it was? Trump said that it's 100% right. They're basically saying, listen, Iran lied going into the deal. Saying, listen, we'll do this deal, but we never had plans for a nuclear weapon. That's our bargaining position. And now they're saying, well, they lied about that. What else are they lying about? And, and you know, Rumsfeld's the one who said, you know, oh, the WMDs, they're, we all know, we know for sure that they're somewhere east, west, north or south of Tikrit. Yeah, and of course they're nowhere to be found. And let's not yeah. kid ourselves. First of all, you're right. That it's it's the same playbook and some of the same players. John Bolton is now back in the yeah, game. Crazy. How does that guy even come back? Like, how does that guy even have the gall to show his face? <laughs> Every single person oh, no. associated with Iraq war should be ashamed. At a minimum, they'd be ashamed and cast off of our airwaves and out of our politics forever. Absolutely, right. yeah, forever. And you mentioned the Benghazi uh, 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 investigation. investigation earlier. I would say, if, you know, you're going to go after Hillary for Benghazi. How about going after Bush and Cheney and everybody else for Iraq? The hundreds of thousands of people that have died there. But, but regardless, you're right. It's it's so crazy how we just keep falling for this thing of okay, because all it's going to take right now is one. I was just watching that. I just started watching the the looming tower, and it's all about the lead up to September 11th. And I was telling my wife, I go, you know what? If there's one attack somewhere, uh, whether it's a terrorist attack or if Iran does something or somewhere. That gives this guy ammunition mm. to take us into a war. Everyone's going to be like, "Oh, we got to be patriotic, go, go war." And they're setting up Iran up as that right now. We we know that for a fact because uh, there's this great video of uh, General Wesley Clark who talks about uh, this is in 2004, 2005 about the plan that he saw in at, at the Pentagon about how they're going to start with Iraq. To Libya, Syria, a bunch of other countries, and, and with Iran. Yeah. Like that's, the, that's the goal of uh, toppling uh, countries that we don't like and starting our own uh, yeah, I public see, government. It, it's a real problem. I mean, he lays it out, and it's going down that path. I see Benjamin Netanyahu's incentives to keep his position is to be very strong with Iran, to play the hold me back kind of person, as Donald Trump is the one who is the deal maker, who on May 12th had the option to renew the, I think it's May 12th, renew the deal with Iran or, or to pull out of it. And now you see Trump as the deal maker. He's kind of looked at every possible deal America has ever had and said, all right, steal, 
Iran, North Korea, it's been stupid. That's like his basic move. Now, with the steel negotiations, he hasn't actually Im implemented them. He has used them to get certain concessions, at least it's been reported, like, you know, basic premises, premises of deals. But I don't know. We'll see what happens. The problem with this Iran deal also is this. Uh, the sanctions only work if there is full agreement among the parties that are going to um, install the sanctions. So we need all of our allies to agree to do the sanctions. Otherwise, it's pointless. We're just hurting ourselves. So if we get rid of this deal and there's no sanctions in place, Iran is now free to pursue their nuclear ambitions, whatever that may be, we're far worse off than we are under the current deal. So um, unless Trump and Bibi have a replacement deal in place that they could reasonably, you know, assure the world community that the Iranians are going to also accept. Just dismantling the existing deal is stupid. Right? Yeah, and, and crazy. And it's and first of all, I've heard a few people talk about how it's so intricate that it's not like you can go in there, you know, it's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not a a la carte kind of a situation <laughs> where you're like, I'll take the dumplings. Uh, <laughs> I'm return the dumplings, I'm going to take the spring roll. Yeah, you can't do you that. Hold the blue Tony. You hold the blue Tony. But, <laughs> But uh, listen, th there is no doubt that the regime, the Iranian regime, you know, I'm sure they 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 are not honest. They they embezzle a lot of money. They uh, are there's a lot of human rights violations. They they are not good people either. Right. But they're that bad said, they're bad actors. But that said, this is currently, in my opinion, the best uh, position we have to move forward. Because if you bring them into the world conversation, eventually. The people in Iran, if they if they if they demand more freedoms, they already are. The women in Iran are taking off the hijab, videotaping themselves, and protesting against this government. And part of that is the internet. The more they see the freedoms in the other rest of the world, the more they want their freedoms. So the more we bring Iran into the world conversation, the harder it is for them to maintain their hard line, to maintain uh, um, their oppression of their own people. And so I personally, as Iranian, want more freedoms. I want change in Iran, but I don't want war with Iran, and I'm afraid that that's what Bibi is pushing for. Awesome. We'll leave it right there. We're going to move on to our next story. Uh, the migrants have arrived. Uh, you may have been following this. It is uh, the, the a group of migrants, migrants, or as Trump has called them, a caravan has been making its way from Central America through Mexico to the American border. Here are some photos of the group that has made it to San Ysidro and other uh, areas along the United States border. Uh, it has been months and months. There is one photo that actually made me tear up. I think it's the next one that we have. Uh, this one, there's so it's it's been a long, arduous trek uh, to the border. Uh, 1,200 began the, avo uh, the voyage in Tapachula, Mexico, and uh, they got to the. And this one also made me kind of emotional because I'm a wuss. But this is the Americans on the other side of the border saying, "Welcome, refugees." Of the 300 that made their way to San Ysidro and uh, similar areas along the border, seven were allowed in. Um, the contingent, uh, the seven was uh, that was admitted included four children and three women, the, the children's mothers, and an 18-year-old man. Uh, so I guess it's eight that were let in. Uh, the organizers said that they did not know whether more of the migrants would be permitted to enter on Monday night. It took all day. They got their Monday, I think it was 24 hours that they were fully there. Um, Trump issued a statement of welcome and hope, saying the migrant caravan that is openly defying our border shows how weak and ineffective U.S. immigration laws are. Yet Democrats like John Tester continue to support the open borders agenda. Tester even voted to protect sanctuary cities. We need lawmakers who will put America first. What message is he sending? What do you think about the arrival of the migrants uh, at the southern border? I like how he makes his tester in. He's, he's after Tester because Tester outed his, uh, the VA guy, right? That, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tester is the person behind. I like how he worked Tester. Talk about the tweet. Talk about vengeful tweets. It's just so bad. He was probably just sitting there going, like, you know, his, 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 his migrant thing. He's like, how do I work Tester in yeah, this exactly. thing? Exactly. He's, he's like, got, like, it's. I want it to be like a board in his office, like the burn book in Mean Girls. Like, it's just like these people have done terrible things and he's just going through and be like, who am I going to have? Yeah. I just don't understand how people can see those kind of pictures and harden, harden their hearts saying no. Right. We're going to turn them away. We're going to abuse and mistreat them. You know, uh, I watched this movie called The Kinder Transport. It's an incredible movie about, about uh, the plight of the Jews during Nazi Germany. 
Because people always say, why don't these Jews just leave Germany? Are they crazy? Why do they stick around? They try. They try to leave. They couldn't go anywhere. They, they were, uh, they were uh, denied visas by every single country in the world, including the United States. And it was the same arguments that you hear today. Oh, they're dirty. They bring disease. And, and they're criminals. And they're going to hurt our economy. They're going to take jobs away. And, and England was the only country that said they'll take the Jews, except they'll only take the, chi uh, the children, not the adults. So Jewish parents have to put their kids on a train bound for England to hope for the best, that their kids will not be you know, abused or whatever it is. And otherwise, they knew what awaited them. And we never learn from historical lessons. I mean, these people who are desperate, who are fleeing, situations of, of, of poverty, crime, and, and death and destruction, and we just say, no, we're not going to take you in. It's incredible to me. Listen, and I came to America as an immigrant. We were fleeing We were fleeing the revolution. And I actually, when they did the travel ban, I got really upset because I thought, because the travel ban, they, the way they implemented it was that day, even if you got visas, we're, we're going to revoke them. So people were stuck in, in, in airports and were being sent back to wherever they just came from. And, and this is very reminiscent of that in that I thought to myself, what would have happened if we had, because to get out of Iran was hard, you know, it was, it was, mm -hmm. and we had, we had, uh, you know, resources, but we kept going to the airport, the airport was shut down, we kept going, we kept coming, finally we, we, we got here. I can't imagine getting here and having someone go get back on that plane, go back, and who knows how you would be treated by the officials as you're coming back. Right. And, like and you, you know, like broke up with them and then you like said, I, this is why I don't like you. I've already, you know, but also like they might criminalize you. Right. Exactly. And, and I, you know, these people are fleeing a, a, a horrible situation. Now I know that the, the, the bigger system, the bigger system is broken in that, like, it would be great if we could help find a solution for these countries so that maybe crime goes down. Maybe the economy gets better. So right. people don't want to flee and come over here. However, as you said, if these guys have come all that way and they're here, uh, it, it's just it's not the America that I know. It's and, and it's it's crazy to me how a lot of these people that support Trump that are from the Christian side, the religious side. How are you religious and supportive of something like this? Mm -hmm. And know? there was that the controversy last week that that uh, Paul Ryan fired. I don't think we got to it on the show, but Paul Ryan fired the chaplain at the Congress, and he's like, no, no, no. It's not because he reminded us that there's certain things about Christian love that say we should accept immigrants, essentially. And, and he spoke about poor people and how we got to help the poor. Right. right. Yes. It's amazing. Well, if we're going to have this attitude, let's just take down the Statue of Liberty, or at least minimum, just wipe off, you know, uh, the message on there about, you know, give me your tired, you're poor. You're we should imagine. keep the Statue of Liberty, but we should brand it with corporations that are given yes. the yes. liberty. Right. Much like a soccer team. The right. Gatorade Statue of Liberty. He's yeah. holding a Gatorade. He's shooting Gatorade. He's like, oh, you're so good. <laughs> you know, it's uh, two, two, two things. First of all, one thing that really pisses me off is when I see other immigrants, and I, I'm an immigrant, and, and there's people within the Iranian community, Middle Eastern yep. community, and during the during uh, um, the elections, I would do jokes. I'd be doing, making fun of Trump in certain ways and saying he's anti-immigrant. And there's so many immigrants that go, he's anti-illegal immigrant. And I'm like, well, what's your name? I'm like, I'm Hossein. I'm like, well, good luck to you, Hossein. <laughs> and, and, and furthermore, though, once he came in with this guy, Stephen Miller, they, yeah. now they want to cut back on immigration. Now they want to have tests for immigration. There's a lot going on. I saw um, uh, um, a, a, a news anchor make a great point because they're saying, oh, we want to make it merit-based, merit-based. Sure, I would love to have the best and the brightest coming to America. But that doesn't mean they're the best people. This one news anchor was saying, my parents came from, I forget where it was, Ireland or whatever, and they said, my dad was a driver, my mother was like a teacher, she might not have gotten merit-based, but now I've become a news anchor on a, on a major network. So, uh, it was Chris Matthews. And, um, and, and so, they are anti-immigrant. Right. And, 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 and so it really pisses me off when immigrants are anti-immigrant. Yeah, you by know, the way, tell your friend the door behind you. It's like tell I your friend saying that, uh, that they are getting U.S. citizens in the sweeps. There are U.S. citizens that are also being swept up because they look different. Yeah. And then they spend, you know, maybe just a couple of hours, maybe several days before they're processed properly and, and allowed to go. Yeah. So, yes, this is a problem. And the other thing, I'm sorry, I know you were, no, I just no, want no. to say, when I saw Trump go nuts on the tweets about the caravan, obviously he's been watching Fox News, and he's like, there's a caravan coming! <laughs> this guy is the most paranoid conspiracy theorist nut job. Yeah. I was like, relax, dude, it's just a traffic jam in Tijuana. <laughs> there's a caravan coming! Oh, this guy, I'm, I mean, we have... We live in a world of fear. intimidated it's by a caravan! Crazy. It's crazy, because he watched it on Fox, and they're like, they're coming. 
and now there's only 300 of them at the border, and if these guys are really in danger, it's like, listen, man, let's figure this out. 300 people, and saw, we saw the picture, just like like little girls crying, and, and, and moms or tired dads who are exhausted from, you know, carrying their kids. It's crazy. It's just crazy that, that we perceive these people as this grave threat, our existential threat to our country. Yeah, well, we got to take a break. When we come back, we have a lot more show for you. Uh, May Day. Uh, we'll tell you where the protests and demonstrations are all around the United States and territories. Don't go away. We'll be right back. T minus one minute till landing. TYT broadcast controllers, listen up. Guy, give me a go, no, go, to landing. Your whole franchise, right? So that's what well, they that's saw, but it took them absorbing the tape of it. I'm just telling you, it was extraordinary. As a performer, all, not, not for one year, for three years. I got it. I got it. Funny feeling, we're going to do another time. We're going to do another time. Well, yeah, because I'm the EP. So I'd like to hear some kind of reaction. Everybody. What do you well, think my reaction to you? I'm looking over the show. Oh, really? 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 Oh
so many companies are desperate to call their mattresses high tech, so they sandwich a little bit of tech into the memory foam. 98% memory foam, still 98% crap. That's a lot Welcome of back to the Young Turks first hour. Brett Ehrlich, Steve O, Maz Jabrani. There is a tweet about Maz Jabrani. Purple is the most uh, durable color. Amber the Brave says, like already my stepdad wants to see Maz Jabrani whenever he gets here. I'm so heartily having him on TYT Live. Go to MazJabrani.com to see when that is going to happen. No more yes, wherever you are, no more body. Welcome to it. Speaking of impressions, memory foam has a big problem. One-on-one. I do a show for your dad. Just give me a cross street. Causing you to seek back to my hopes and dreams. And the time. Or, well, have you ever performed in someone's house? I've done home. I did. I did a show in a house in Saudi Arabia. Oh my God! Oh, it was crazy. Deep sleep requires one prince to come to a show. Temperature new. Young guy. Great design. And he goes. My cousins were too young. Like they weren't allowed at this event because it was. It was at a at an expat compound. Right, so it's mixed are men and women really mixed before this whole thing has now happened where they're having, you know, they're opening up a little bit more. And but uh, he goes, can you come to the show for my cousins, cousins and, 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 you know, and nieces and nephews? And we show up and it was all you need to do is a bunch of kids from like 5 to 12 or 13. No pressure we would hang out in the foyer and they were in the little room and then their moms were seated over here and the instructions were do not talk to the moms. Don't say anything to the moms. And then the man we were over talk, there. Don't touch so the instructions were, you can talk to the nannies. <laughs> so good. Yeah, so, so we'd be there, like, hey, how you doing? What's going on? I'd be like, oh, what's your name, nanny? And then they'd be giggling, and the moms didn't even speak English. They're like, well, yeah, well, holla, holla. <laughs> 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 so good. Uh, we have more, oh, man. <laughs> more tweets. Uh, Danger Carlos Danger. Well, Bolton does have the gall to have the mustache, so he yeah. has the gall to do all this terrible stuff. Nikki Goldenheart says, ha ha ha, that loss of space graphic is hilarious. Danger Will Robinson. Don't know what that I didn't watch. I'm sure it was amazing. Um, Trump and Bolton from Jay says, Trump and Bolton are going to force amphibious landing in Iran. When then mountain and warfare, uh, they're going to get a lot of Americans killed for no good reason. So from that's, that's dark. Yeah. Um, all right, we have a few more minutes left. We're going to try to get a couple stories in. Uh, first, the May Day protests. It's May 1st, May Day, a.k.a. International Workers' Day. All over the world, people are protesting uh, or are demonstrating in favor of workers' rights. So we have some photos of some of the marches. This is in New York. These are the ones that came across the wire in time for them to be turned into magic graphics for all of you. Um, an organizer of one of them in Los, in uh, New York said the Trump administration has made very clear that they've declared war on the immigrant community on all levels. This is according to Javier Valdez, co-executive director of the advocacy group Make the Road New York. Now, in recent years, according to this report from NBC News, there has been kind of a... A, uni a union between uh, work, the workers, labor, International Labor Day, and then um, immigrants to try to kind of pull it together and have them work together to make change. Uh, and one of the focuses is on the election, taking all of this. We've seen uh, marches from around the world over and around the United States and try to focus it on making an electoral difference. This is from uh, Angelica Salas or Angelica Salas in Los Angeles, who said uh, elections have consequences and the consequences for our community have been dire. And if we do not change the balance of power, we question our ability to remain free in this country, essentially saying we need to make a difference in every election that happens between now and forever to get the kind of change we want. Uh, reactions to the Labor Day situation, or the, the International Workers' Day situation. Yeah, so uh, I don't know how much you guys know about May Day and its origins, but it's really interesting because May Day started here in the U.S., in Chicago, uh, in, 19, in 1886, uh, but it's no longer celebrated here. And, in fact, I think there has been a, um, a, a very purposeful and intentional effort to wipe it off our, from our history. Um, it's celebrated worldwide, and it's where workers gather, and they celebrate the importance of workers' rights. So in 1886, in Chicago, at, at Haymarket, there was a demonstration. That day, I believe there were 300,000 workers nationwide that went on strike. So uh, it started there, and a woman named Lucy Parsons was like the leader of it. She was a former slave. She was also part Mexican-American, part African-American, and um, she got folks to come together uh, as workers, uh, across racial uh, lines, and that's very threatening to the power structure. So uh, cops, you know, uh, like they did with, against Occupy, they broke that uh, that protest, and then a couple of days later, they came back 
uh, in the spirit of, well, you, you know, you may have killed some of us, but we're not going to go away. The workers gathered again with the mayor of Chicago. And it was a peaceful um, uh, um, protest. And cops again came, and then someone threw a bomb. The cops fired indiscriminately into the crowd. A bunch of people died. And uh, seven people were charged with uh, all kinds of crimes in relation to that incident. Four were hanged. Three were later pardoned because many of them weren't even there. Of the, of the seven, I think only, only maybe three were even physically there. Anyway, the whole thing was a disaster. Um, but in an effort to wipe May Day off from our history books, in the U.S., it was changed to Labor Day uh, in September to kind of disconnect from, from uh, May Day. And 70 years later, it was still on you know the minds of people because Eisenhower tried to change May Day into National Law and Order Day, May 1st, which sounds not fun at all. <laughs> um, yeah, well, now yeah. you can just get together and watch a lot of Law and Order. <laughs> yeah. So there's some, some extra yeah. Law and Order. Yeah. 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 Whole different meeting. That's right. Yeah. Can so, I watch so that's, that count? Uh, yeah. yeah, so that's Hilarious. that's May Day, and uh, you know today there's celebrations and and um, commemorations all over the world, but the U.S. is largely forgotten. I mean, we should learn about Lucy Parsons. We should learn about May Day in our history books. We just did, Steve-O, thanks to you. I just had, like, I felt like you were the Rachel Maddow of the show. Right. I appreciate yeah. that. I learned that. Yeah, but you're Rachel, Rachel Maddow. Maddow. We, have, yeah. we have the same haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Uh, direct your tweets to Steve-O about uh, appearance and, I don't know, something like that. Anyways, uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, demonstrators in Puerto Rico, it actually did. Kind of, it was kind of reminiscent about uh, of, of the violence that you kind of mentioned. Uh, Puerto Rico demonstrators battled police on San Juan streets today as they marched against proposed cuts to retirement benefits and looser labor laws. As the bankrupt island seeks to reduce a seventy-four billion dollar debt, uh, they have a group called Se Acabaron las Promesas, which is a, a play on the Promesa, which was the like uh, bailout deal that was made with Puerto Rico and has essentially been reneged on in the eyes of the uh, labor movement there. They say, uh, according to Bloomberg, a report says public employees throughout the U.S. for decades have accepted an implicit deal, low wages in exchange for comfortable and secure retirements. Um, but it seems that with this new, um, there's a federal panel that's saying, listen, we will help you out and bail you out from your debt as long as we kind of essentially dismantle your um your pension programs, which is just utterly unfair and very, it's got to be very frustrating if you spend years and years working as a public employee, and it's it seems like it's all kind of going away, not to mention all the terrible trouble that's been facing Puerto Rico for since the hurricane. The, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the entire uh, island lost power because one tree fell, or one person backed a, a, a bulldozer into a storm. Like Both of those things happened. It was terrible. Uh, we have time for one more story. Uh, this one is uh, another Trump associate has been raided, but it was not by the government It uh, or Bob Mueller. Trump's former uh, Dr. Harold Bornstein, the guy who said that Trump was the healthiest person ever to walk the planet, uh, also said to the New York Times that he took Propecia. It turns out a few days later, he was raided by certain individuals. Here is his description of the events. Let's take a look. What exactly were they looking for? Well, the medical records, his pictures, anything I could find. We must have been here for 25 or 30 minutes. We created a lot of chaos. I couldn't believe anybody was making a big deal about a drug that's to grow, to grow his hair, which seemed to be so important. And it certainly is not a breach of medical trust to tell somebody they take Ropecia to grow their hair. What's the matter with that? <laughs> what is the matter with that? He looks like Steven Spielberg's puppet older brother. <laughs> well, he, doesn't, he doesn't need Propecia. This guy has lots of hair. This guy is crazy. He overdosed on Propecia. <laughs> <laughs> Propecia is just like he secretes it from a gland. You know, the lesson learned for this guy and anyone else who supports Trump is that he is not as loyal as he says he is. He's, He's not loyal he at all. At all. At all. At all. And it's only a matter of time when he turns on you. I mean, he's turning on Michael Cohen, his yeah. longtime personal lawyer. Yeah. So, uh, you know, all of the, all of you who are inside with Trump, your day will come when he turns on you, too. Yeah. yeah. The, the, per, the people who raided this guy's stash of Trump files uh, were Trump's bodyguard, Keith Schiller, uh, and his a lawyer with the Trump organization, and a third man that came to the office, according to reports 
uh, it happened on February 13, 2017. What is the justification given by the White House in response? Well, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders called it standard operating procedure for the White House Medical Unit to obtain the newly president, newly elected president's medical record, records. Uh, that was what was taking place, is those records were being transferred over the White House Medical Unit as requested. I have, I have switched doctors in the past. And usually, I don't send my bodyguard and lawyer to get the records. You just call them and go, can you please send the records to this new doctor's office? So, no, Sarah. Again, lying again. And Michelle Wolf did a good job coming after you. You're lying, lying, lying. I think Michelle Wolf was kind, very kind to her. Absolutely. You know what the point I made about that was? Yeah. For everyone who's complained about Michelle Wolf's appearance on the White House Correspondents there saying that she was mean, she was this, she was that. Take, take note that Donald Trump should have been sitting in that seat. He sent Sarah Huckabee Sanders into the Lions, and what did he say? So he's to blame again. Instead of taking the bullet, he sends her up there. What, 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 what was she supposed to do? Give her compliments about her lying abilities? So ridiculous. So ridiculous. We Actually, there's a, there's a related story that we have about that, and I do want to get to it. So um, Donald Trump was not at the White House Correspondence Center. Uh, he went to Michigan, incidentally. Uh, and while in Michigan, he did not bring up the Flint water crisis whatsoever. He went there to say, like, there's more important stuff. He said, uh, you may have heard I was invited to another event tonight. I'd much rather be in Washington, Michigan, which is the name of the city in Michigan he went to, than Washington, D.C. So he skipped out on the Michelle Wolf convention to say he's a man of the people. And if you have any questions about what a man of the people Donald Trump is, you're going to have to catch him between members only events at Mar-a-Lago this weekend. I, too, would rather have him in Washington, Michigan, for good. <laughs> yeah. Please, go, stay. Did you, what were your thoughts about this whole Michelle Wolf situation? No, I, 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 I thought it was unbelievable, the, the heat that she took from mainstream media. And I said, I'm embarrassed for that. To, to say that Michelle Wolf, a fairly unknown comedian, is bullying uh, the White House is just preposterous. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. She was hired to roast them, and she roasted them. It, it, it was totally fine. What they're really mad about is that she made fun of the media. She said that the media created Trump, and now they're profiting off of him. And, right. And she called him out. And then she ended the segment by saying Flint still doesn't have clean water. So, so kudos to Michelle. I thought she was fantastic. She did. She did great. She had a lot of jokes that hit. She was funny. She was. She was. She had points. I mean, that's the kind of comedy that I love. Yeah. The comedy with a message. And the whole point is supposed to take the jokes. Now, if you know, if you notice, Kellyanne Conway was made fun of, but she was in the audience. Chris Christie was made fun of in the audience. Rance Priebus in the audience. So the camera would get him, go back, get him, go back. But when you sit Sarah Huckabee Sanders up in the front, that's the most uncomfortable position because you got to kind of smile and be like, <laughs> but she didn't smile. She was seething. And I felt bad for her because, you know, any jokes about, because the jo there's a debate about the joke, about the looks. I don't think it was a joke said. by her. It, it, Two things. One, that she uh, takes lies, crushes, burns that, or takes truths, burns them, and makes facts. a person for facts. Facts. Yeah. yeah. Burns them and makes a smoky eye with them. And the other was, I loved you as Aunt Lydia in The Handmaid's Tale. Aunt Lydia, who is the, who's played by Anne Dowd, who you might also know as Margot Martindale. They look similar. Yeah. Um, but essentially saying that Comparing her, I don't think it was necessarily look. Their looks are both bad, but rather but she's like she, it's the bad first man yeah. for the terrible totalitarian regime. Yeah, and it's not. Listen, so they weren't that bad of jokes in terms of like they weren't. I mean, I just you know, but but regardless, she's sitting up there. That's the position, and she did her job. The press, first of all, somebody hired her, so you better know what you're getting. Secondly, everyone in the press who was criticizing that. They don't have the balls to stand up then to the administration. And Michelle Wolf went and she, she spoke a lot of truths. So if you don't have the balls to stand up, don't go uh, uh, after a comedian who has the balls. You know how hard it is to be funny and make a point? Yes. I, I mean, yeah, it ain't I, easy. Because you see it year in and year out. I always hate that they're like, we hired a comedian and we can't believe they told jokes. <laughs> yeah, if you want, you know what? If you want some uh, silly guy, get a Trump impersonator, write the script for him. Right. So, do you know what was offensive? The time that George Bush, after, you know, during the Iraq War, made jokes about, wait, where's the, where the WME? It's not there. It's not there. Yeah. And he's making fun of the fact that you can find a, w, uh, a WMDs. Yeah, WMDs. WMDs. Yeah, yeah. That's the way you more yeah, 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 yeah. WMDs. I can't find them either. Yeah. 
Um, so that's offensive. I mean, people have died. Many people have died, and you're making fun of that process. Right? And she called them out for lying, and they lie every day. She lies every day. Sarah Huckabee Sanders lies. Donald Trump lies. Oh, all the and these people. So she called them out in very funny ways. So why is the press? Are you sitting there going, "Oh my God, I can't believe." She's doing this. Yeah. Maybe because you're not doing it enough yeah. or right. I, I watch. I do a segment on their Facebook original. Watch the breakdown on Facebook where I, you know, I stand in for Sarah Huckabee Sanders and honestly answer the questions asked by the press. So I have to watch those all the time. I would much rather have Sean Spicer than Sarah Sanders because at least Spicer flails. <laughs> at least he's just like, I uh, just gets mad, visually upset. Sarah Huckabee Sanders just kind of sits there and recites lie after lie, ridiculous statement after ridiculous statement, looking people directly in the eye. That's all she does all day. And I'd much rather have someone who is visibly shaken. The reason that we have this like water for chocolate logo, which we'll get to now, is that Trump went to Michigan and did not talk about the Flint water crisis. Michelle Wolf did. That was what she left everyone with. And she said that, you, you know, just so I remind everybody, Flint still doesn't have clean water. Donald Trump, in his ridiculous move to go to Washington, Michigan, did not bring it up. He spoke for 80 minutes, but he never mentioned the ongoing water crisis just 50 miles away in Flint, an issue that a government-appointed Civil Rights Commission concluded in 2016 was exacerbated by historical, structural, and systemic racism combined with implicit bias. He was using this, this trip. I mean, he's been trying to get the black vote, essentially cuddling up with his Kanye West and saying in the past, like, you know, what do you got to lose? You might as well vote for me. Well, you're ignoring a Flint, Michigan issue, which is a predominant black city. Um, according to a Columbia University professor, they said the highest lead level recorded in Flint was 13,000 parts per billion in 2015. This was more than 866 times the federal guidelines of 15 parts per billion. Um, and it's ridiculous. 6,200 homes have had their pipes replaced, but there's still 12,000 homes um, that have not been replaced. And all this against the backdrop of Nestle has been allowed to pump 200,000 gallons a day of water, clean water, to bottle it and sell it. And this is just something that folks in Michigan went to Lansing to protest, saying you are going to let Nestle go and sell water that they pump from underneath us when it should go to the people of Flint, Michigan, and instead of giving that to us. And that announcement came a while back, right after, right around the time where they announced that Flint, Michigan would no longer be giving bottles of water out to people. So it's a giant problem. The solution is only going to happen if everybody continues to voice their, their concern about it and uh, keep the uh, awareness up. That's all the time we have in this hour. Big thanks to Steve-O Mazzabrani, Mazzabrani.com. See where he's touring. Watch the Netflix specials. Thank you guys both. Grace Baldridge and others are here next hour. Stay tuned. We'll be back after this. Right now. Come on, let me have it. Don't. The Celtics were without Jalen Brown last night, but they still blew out the Sixers in Game One. Terry Rozier led the way with 29 points, and they proceeded to add 28 in Game Two's Thursday. Brought by Emma Stone and the analyst Jackson Russell. Good morning. They still have the two best players this year. They're beating us. The theory that some progressives had about Trump getting elected being a good thing because he would destroy so badly that people would be ready to uh, throw in support for a true progressive. But I'm worried that the opposite is happening. That Trump is so extreme, so disastrous, that he has now desensitized us to politicians that we typically would not like enough. Even on the right, like, oh, uh, we just but impeach Trump, but I believe we some of those trees, they're not going to be five standards. Every night, they're going to come up with those hands that are falling. Then we're going to see who the game is dipping to. And what are the Democrats? They just say it's just one of the positions. Well, that's not 
There's not one more airplane with a big body. But we there's nobody that can deal with one on one on one. We have uh, a better deal. Air Bane's better than one. Better than Trump. Beat on him. Oh, my God. I got the six wins again. The first six ever series and I got the online six eliminating the show. man, the king of Akra, the beast of the east, to the final. And that would be a fact to see because that would be a spectacle of an American Cup Finals. If it's six young soldiers versus older ones. Uh, it, we have a procedure. We have a due process. That is America. America. No, no. I'm not going to make a stand there old in LeBron. Get him serious. He's a jack in one. He's a LeBron by a frail. Stop. He's going to pull the trigger by a frail. He has no strap. He has no strap. He has no strap. He has no strap. You're not going to battle without the whole round guy. Frustration. 99 plus new channel. I'm going to battle with Zara. I'm going to battle with Zara. You give me level, you give me level one right now. Hey, Kevin Rogan, five-time motherfucker. The young Turk is even a nurse. We do it. Yeah. She watched on live stream. Yeah, it's a monopoly. And he hands up and he gets out. He got bigger part of the point. He got to say, I mean, I'm not helping you. Why? I'm saying he hurt myself. But I'm saying, don't give that way. You got to hold me. To, uh, off the top, I think we should just jump in with this bit of breaking news from the Kanye West front. Let's just talk about this and get this over with, and then we're going to be talking about uh, Stormy Daniels, Meek Mill, we're going to be talking about charter schools, a whole mess of it. So uh, with that said, let's just jump, jump right in. Kanye West stopped by TMZ, and he said a number of controversial things. One of them is that uh, slavery, he says, quote, is a choice. We have a video from TMZ. Let's take a look right now. You hear about slavery for 400 years? For 400 years? That sounds like a choice. <laughs> like, it was there for 400 years, and it's all of y'all? You know, like, it's like we're, we're mentally in prison. I like the word prison because slavery goes to, too too direct to the uh idea of blacks it's like slavery holocaust holocaust jews uh slavery is blacks so prison is something that unites us as one race blacks and whites being one race uh that we're one we're, we're the human race okay so before i toss over to the panel i want to apply a little bit more context because that was just kanye west's quote he then sort of turns it over to the newsroom in tmz and van lathan who's a writer at tmz responded and this is what he said he says you're entitled to believe whatever you want but there is fact and real world real life consequence behind everything you just said and while you are making music and being an artist and living the life that you've earned by being a genius the rest of us in society have to deal with these threats to our lives you have to deal with the marginalization that has come from the 400 years of slavery that you said for our people was a choice, ending by saying that he was disappointed, appalled, and unbelievably hurt by the fact that you have morphed into something that, to me, is not real. So really powerful words. This is going absolutely viral right now. What was the response when you guys saw this? I know this was sort of a breaking story that we got just before we went to tape. What did you think? 
I think Kanye is really trying to sell an album. And I think that um, this is a social experiment, I hope. And he's trying to see if he can go as far as he can go and still get people to buy his albums and show people that he owns it. Um, I, uh, like I said last time, and I got really angry about it. And then I started thinking and reflecting. And I'm like, why is Kanye West? Does he matter in my every day? And he doesn't. And he doesn't matter in the lives of all of the people who have to go to work and all of the people who are suffering the, the effects of the systemic oppression that has been in place for hundreds of years, which is not a figment of anybody's imagination. And it wasn't um, a decision or a choice. It seems to me like it is Kanye's choice to be mentally imprisoned right now with this ideology that he's trying to drop on the the young minds who are impressionable and listening to him. But as far as being disappointed, I mean, we really hold him to a high standard and really keep giving him a mic. And I just think that they need to cut Kanye's microphone off because like I said last time, when Kanye tweeted a picture of his home and tweeted about his Tesla, he is completely disconnected from the struggle that every single uh, person on the planet who is working to live another day, is he's, he is basking in his wealth and in his privilege, and he is completely disconnected to the everyday experience of those of us who have to go to work and really uh, live in reality. So, Nathan, do you think that Van Lathan's words really woke him up? Because it, it seemed like in that moment how incredibly bold that must have been to just stand up in this workroom and address Kanye West. I was incredibly moved by Van Lathan's yes. statements because he was in a workspace and he took it upon himself to intervene in this moment when the rest of the TMZ team was just listening to him <laughs> without rebuke. And so I really wanted to see the interaction after Kanye came up to him and, and apologized, but apologized and then what? Mm -hmm. Apologized that he felt hurt and that was it. And I think this is, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think this is a product also of our education system. We focus and emphasize more on opinions over curious questions. I mean, what is he tweeting about in terms of history? He, in 400 years, he's erasing all the slave rebellions. He's erasing all the Nat Turners. He's erasing all the Harriet Tubmans. He's erasing the white abolitionists that fought against slavery, like John Brown, and sacrificed their lives. And then the, the period afterwards that some historians call slavery by another name, the convict leasing system, the rise of the prison industrial complex, the way that this encoded in our laws, and how Jim Crow rises up as well. So this man is just literally speaking from the hip and we are listening to him. And I think that's absolutely the issue is when are we going to say, I don't want to give you the mic. If folks can give him the mic and I know we we're talking about him too, but it's because his statements are so irresponsible. They do have consequences and the right wing, the alt-right is going to use it as fodder yes. and it's going to be such a devastating blow just for promotion. I, you know, he's so big on, on free thought. It's been sort of his, uh, his main uh, narrative that he's pushing right now. You can't stifle my free thought. This is just, you know, free thinking. I love people who think freely. But you, you have to recognize that this free thought is being used as basically just a pawn for a, a side that would serve to just further marginalize these communities. And it, I don't understand how he's no, not seeing it. that and how he's not being manipulated. And how when you see Donald Trump calling Kanye West out at a rally, you know, as, as this, you know, he is the the spokesman for whatever cause, how he's being a puppet. You, know, I would black men, you, you mentioned blacks and Latinos, but it's also it's contradictory, it's conflicting. When he was trying to do his clothing line, he was talking about how racism remember yeah, he was sitting at the way he was marginalized. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's just when it's convenient. It's whatever is wherever the wind goes and everybody keeps falling for it. Yep. He, he just talked about racism today. Mm. He was talking about racism. Racism is a direct it is a is a a result of slavery, right? So then, if slavery doesn't exist, why are you talking? Why does racism exist when it pertains to you, but not everybody else? Yeah. Well, let's move on. Let's not give many more air time. <laughs> I think we broke that down. We're going to take a very bizarre turn, uh, which is going to be a little bit about Stormy Daniels. So here's the latest on what's going on with Stormy Daniels. Stormy Daniels has uh, filed a lawsuit against Pre President Trump for defamation. Stormy Dan Daniels filed a complaint in federal court in New York on Monday. At issue is a tweet Trump made in which he dismissed a composite sketch that Daniels says depicted a man who threatened her in 2011 to stay quiet about her alleged sexual encounter with Trump. Uh, do we have that tweet? 
So this is the tweet in question. It says a sketch years later about a non-existent man, a total con job, playing the fake news media for fools, parentheses, but they know it. So here's a little bit more about that filing. The filing says the tweet was false and defamatory, arguing that Trump was speaking about Daniels and that he knew that his false, disparaging statement would be read by people around the world, as well as widely reported. It also says Daniels has been exposed to death threats and other threats of physical violence. Uh, and just a, a little bit of an update on where we are with Stormy Daniels and her lawsuits against the president. The lawsuit is the latest legal move from Daniels, who already is suing to be released from a non-disclosure deal she agreed to days before before the 2016 election in exchange for $130,000. The payment was made by the president's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen. Um, basically, the, the legal team, Stephanie Clifford, uh, has uh, that is her legal name, her attorney said, we intend on teaching Mr. Trump that, he, that you simply cannot make things up about someone and disseminate them without serious consequences. So my question for the panel is, is this the legal action that will set that uh, precedent? Um, is this, this going to work effectively? I don't know, but I, I hope that more sex yeah. scandals means that Trump has less time to govern. Yeah. That is like what I sincerely hope. <laughs> if he's down been like embroiled this. in these sex scandals and he's only tweeting about those things, then right. we hopefully he just turns his eye away from governing. Um, I also wonder if like Kylie Jenner was a little prescient and naming her daughter Stormy could be the one who brings down this administration. <laughs> Wouldn't that be, would that be some foresight? Um, you know what? I, I, this stuff is surreal to me. We're having a conversation about a porn star and the president of the free world having an affair. This is a conversation that we're having, and the hypocrisy that I have seen in America is just so disgusting to me because Bill Clinton, they drug, drug, oh, drug, yeah. drug, drug him. And this. I mean, it, every day it gets saucier and saucier like a soap opera and we still we're still here i'm just waiting on the day that america collectively wakes up and makes a decision that this is just not good enough for this country like that's that's just where i am it's just ridiculous also the guy in the picture looks like jacks from sons of anarchy <laughs> oh yeah like the guy the kids or brad pitt oh yeah but i just i'm just like i can't believe we, we're even having this. do you think his base cares about this of course not. They are, like, obsessed with their confirmation bias. They're only looking for things that support their worldview. And so I don't know what the last nail, I'm sorry, as I said, I'm really bad with American proverbs, but what the last nail in the coffin is right. for his supporters. I know there were some things, especially for women, that inspired them to detract from the movement. Mm -hmm. But I'm also looking forward to seeing what that red line is for folks because not only did they drag Bill Clinton, imagine if Obama did oh, this. Girl. It'd be oh, his yeah. mortal sin. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point, just sort of the, the what-ifs in this the situation and how we would have held Obama accountable and how the media would have responded to that. Because I kind of feel like this story with Stormy Daniels was a, a real hot topic at first, and now it's sort of lost its legs. And it doesn't really seem like people care, and I think that's important because uh, the the right doesn't really want it to be a big issue, and for, for and, and, and to an extent, a lot of people are like, it's his personal life, you know, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But this is we're talking about defamation, and that's that's serious. And I, I think that it is an interesting uh, move that her legal team is trying to see if they can pull off. And I think that there is, I think there's a case there for sure. That credibility, like right. even though we we had this conversation the last time, and Hannah was like, well, I think you should be able to do whatever you want to do if you're an adult. I don't judge people and their morality or whatever. But this is an issue of credibility with somebody who lies and is and is dishonest. And and perjury. Like, that's perjury. And it's yeah, perjury it's if you want to go legally. It's yeah. perjury. And then, and, and, and because they are always preaching morality. It's like, well, it's the same thing. It's this, this double standard. Yeah, conservative family values. Yeah. It's just, it is sort of this double standard. We have to go to a break right now. When we come back, we have a whole bunch of more stories. We're going to read some tweets as well. We're going to be talking about Meek Mill charter schools, uh, and uh, I hope we get to this story, a Facebook dating app. So stay with us back after the break. The world of the young Turks are momentous there. What now? What now? <laughs> we get animated about this. Yes, we're not the robots out here. I actually care about the news. Guilty. Guilty, I care. You know, Senator Sanders, I'm going to do something unusual. I'm going to ask you a policy question. <laughs> How dare you? That's the problem. You're the problem. Don't ever attack a Republican. Where is it? I don't see it. Tell them that. These are all 
all establishment guys. They love the system as it is. They're all enormously rich off the system that exists for us. This system isn't working. So what this campaign is about is trying to create an economy that works not only for the people on top, but works for all of our So what's happening in the Democratic Party is what used to happen in the general election. We would have a person who represented workers and the people and the voters, and then the Republicans would represent business and corporations and Wall Street, and we'd have a freaking election. That's happening all inside the Democratic Party this time. And instead of focusing on issues that actually matter to millennial voters, for instance, we're focusing on non-issues in the country. The fear well, of about Muslims and terrorism. Here comes Bernie from Illinois. Tell your friends to put your family in this I'm not take my over. That voice in the wilderness, it created a ripple of that, which then now is a tidal wave as we stand right now. I love this show. We're going to rock the boat. We're going to be counter-establishment. We're going to tell people the truth to the best of our abilities. And, and we're going to keep it real. Hey, you trust the establishment media. The United States economy has never been better. Monetary policy is spectacular. Everybody thought Jamie Dimon was the king of Wall Street last week? Well, it might be Kevin Lewis from the half and takes the crowd. The best sales force out there is Merrill Lynch, and now it goes to the United It's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Buying opportunity. I do think this is a buying opportunity. We're going to see a stabilization and just a tremendous snapback. The rally will be jaw dropping. The Occupy Wall Street movement is not, is not a spontaneous protest against economic inequality. This is what we mean by the establishment press. It is a well thought out campaign, well thought out campaign to bring down the infrastructure structure of this country. The embarrassment is that I'm given credibility in this world because of the disappointment that the public has for what the news media does. I'm the former chairman of the Veterans Committee, and I learned a little bit about the cost of war. What the president is trying to do, and I agree with him, is to do everything that we can without going to war. So what do you say to your critics? I'm talking about Democratic critics who say, you know what, You're, he's really just a socialist pacifist. I very rarely read in any coverage of Bernie that he's a socialist. Bernie Sanders is a socialist, for God's sake. Most analysts are saying that Hillary Clinton's going to win in a landslide. I continue to believe Mr. Trump will not be president. I got Trump at 279, 259. We're not going to be polite anymore. You know what we're going to do? We're going to fight back. Fight for a free and independent media. We're done with politeness. We fight back. We are going to put together the best investigative reporting team in the country. CYT will give you the four horse horse and we will let them gallop. Help unleash real journalism in the country. We don't need anybody else anymore but you guys. This is going to be amazing. Welcome back to the second hour. We're going to jump into some stories, but first I want to read us some tweets uh, from our members. Ed says, guys, he's just a crazy person. That's it with regards to Kanye West. On Mental there. Health Awareness Day. Uh, <laughs> uh, Carrie G says, this panel for hour two is fabulous in caps. Thank you, Carrie G. Thank you. And uh, Fei Fei says, how does one become a member of the day? I actually do not know that. <laughs> but if, if I can say it, then you are. Then you are that. Because they gave me a microphone. So wouldn't you know it, Fei Fei? You are the member of the day. Uh, let's move in. We're going to have a, a pretty heavy uh, middle section. And then we'll... Actually, the, the whole rest of this is pretty heavy until we get to the Facebook dating. But stay with me. It's going to be good. And it's going to have some good discussion. So... It is being reported that Meek Mill sought a pardon via a Trump-connected lobbyist. Let me break down some details for you. According to lobbying records reviewed by TYT, Casey's firm, uh, Quantum International was hired in March by Robert Rameek Williams, Mill's real name, to lobby for a pardon by the President of the United States for Mr. Williams' unjust treatment and violation of civil rights. The government entity it says Casey contacted on Mill's behalf is named as the President of the United States. This is referring to Kerry Casey, who is a Trump-connected lobbyist 
also married to a former high-ranking Trump executive. Uh, I want to get a response from the panel, but first let me break down a little bit what's going on with uh, Mill. Mill was released from prison on April 24th after Pennsylvania's Supreme Court granted a request by prosecutors to vacate his conviction due to questions about the arresting officer's credibility. Whether he will face a new trial will be decided at a hearing in June. The 30-year-old rapper had been in and out of prison for a decade, becoming a cause celebre among supporters who saw his case as emblematic of a draconian and racist justice system. Uh, and what we know about his affiliation with Casey is pretty limited, and I'll just outline that quickly. Casey first registered as Mills' lobbyist on March 12, 2018. Her first quarter lobbying disclosure form says he paid her an unspecified amount under 5000 between that date and the end of the month on April 11th. Her husband tweeted an article about Mills' incarceration. So is this significant? What are your takeaways from this story? Um, there have been stories like this before, and I do think that his story is very emblematic, as the, the article was saying, of Meek Mill being the victim of being locked into a system. It was 2008 was the last time that he was convicted of a serious crime, and then after that it was all parole, parole violations. So, I mean, I think the last one, or one of the last ones, was popping wheelies on his dirt bike. And that's ridiculous that he's in prison for two to four years. So I understand the indignation around this and trying to figure out any political route to to get out. And even the district attorney, Larry Krasner, said that he affirmed that the sentence should be thrown out. So everybody in this political configuration was saying that this is ridiculous. And I will draw um, your attention to something that happened actually in 2008. Grammy award-winning rapper, um, producer... John Forte was actually convicted in 2001 with drug-related char charges. And you know who got him a pardon? Who pardoned him? Like one of those midnight hour pardons was George W. Bush. So I understand when these weird sort of unholy alliances happen. And not that I'm advocating, quote unquote, playing with the devil, but it, when you're in that circumstance, it's hard to not be empathetic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I agree. And I think she's so... I like to hear her talk. I had, a, I had a Cardi B moment. <laughs> but um, I, I think the battle with uh, the disenfranchised people of color and people of lower income neighborhoods and come, that come from these areas is the, the battle of between reflection and connection. Like mm -hmm. you see a reflection in yourself, the people that look like you, who look like you, and uh, and you know that these things that happen. Meek released a beautiful statement when he got you know released about how it, you know, it, it's great to be released, but he knows that a lot of people who don't have the money and the resources that he have, who, who young black men, who are, won't have the same out. Mm -hmm. And so I think that a lot of times we, uh, we condemn, you know, people who have these opportunities because they are not in the struggle with us anymore. Meek is not part of the everyday man in Philadelphia, even where he's from. But the fact that he moves something forward could be helpful, you know, for those young black men. And I do believe that sometimes who, you know, someone asked me one time about an agent and they said, what do you think about this agent? And I said, I think he's the devil. And they're like, well, why are you signed to him? I'm like, because who better to represent you in hell than the devil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting wow. point. So people yeah. are people have some questions about how Meek Mill got into contact with this person. As of now, it's still pretty vague. But here's something that we know: it's not clear how Mill came into uh, came to be a client of Quantum, which describes itself as a boutique firm in the formation stages. The company's disclosure forms indicate that Casey has only had one other client for about a year. So it, it's still pretty mysterious. But I, I hear what both of you guys are saying in the sense of like. When your back is against the wall, um, how can you fault him for trying to get out of the system? And something that I that I learned as well is a huge limitation for him was put on his travel. He's a musician, yes. Yes. and that absolutely limits yes. his opportunity yes. to yes. create a better life for himself. That's how he violated one of his right, roles. right, yeah, right. Yeah. And I mean, and how that must be so incredibly infuriating. Where it's like, all right, don't you know, just just be a rapper, but only here, and just talk. you absolutely have to limit yourself and the opportunity that you can dream up, which is. For, for a parole violation yeah. and then in, in violating that you're trying to grow your career and then you're getting slapped again for that it's it's ridiculous and so I, I understand um, why this has been so emblematic of, of the system and uh, it's, it's just an interesting story his association with that now we're going to move on uh, to uh, another pretty heavy hitting story this one is just just about got my head spinning so I'm excited to talk about it with you guys 
There is an NPR affiliate out of Illinois that is reporting some eye-opening policies at the Noble Network of Charter Schools, policies that they say are driving away teachers and, quote, dehumanizing students. Uh, we're going to get into the details of this, but some of them that they are saying is that uh, there are limited bathroom breaks, and as a result of this, students are bleeding when they're menstruating through their pants, and that they've found ways around this by... Uh, changing the dress code so you can have sweatshirts around your waist. Uh, that's one of it. There's also the dress code, which is apparently uh, really isolating to the students of color with regards to their hair, um, and also the, a really strict demerit system. So this is coming out through NPR. The president of the Noble Charter, the Noble Network of Charter Schools, has released a statement. That's Constance Jones, Brewer, president of the Noble Network of Charter Schools, sent an email to staff after the initial NPR report, characterizing parts of the story as quote, exaggerated or plainly false, saying, I've seen how our leaders and staff continue to break new ground, push each other's thinking, and improve the noble experience every year. So while I acknowledge our imperfections, I also celebrate our willingness and flexibility to hold each other accountable and get better. And I just don't see the noble that I know and love reflected in this article. It is a comprehensive article. I really urge you guys to read through the whole thing. Uh, it's very, very eye-opening. I really enjoyed a take from uh, Carice Epps, who was a teacher at one of the noble schools, uh, she talks a little bit about what was her breaking point when she decided to leave and a, a number of other things with regards to her experience at these schools. She says, that moment came when I sat and reflected on the fact that I trained my students to close the door if a student was being perp walked out of our building, which happened often, she says, because for discipline issues like a fight, our children were arrested and walked out of the school and I was useless. I could not help that child. Epps now works as a public policy fellow for the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, there's a lot to talk about here. When you guys read through this article and some of the headlines that it's been making, uh, what, were, what was your response? Constance Jones or Aunt Lydia, uh, as they call you on the hands made tale. Like I, I have a black daughter. So, and I, I have a young black daughter and I was a young my, minority brown Latina girl from the inner city. Uh, one of the most humiliating things that ever happens to a young woman is when she starts menstruating is that moment when it goes through your clothes and you have to not only physically bear the embarrassment of that, but emotionally deal with and the discomfort yeah. of being bloody, you know, so even a, a sweater that you tie around that may save you a little bit of shame does not still rid you of the discomfort, but the greater issue for me is the, de the dehumanization of young black bodies, young black girls. They, they cannot be who they are. The, co the hair color thing, that they have to have a marker. It feels like, um, it feels like some new world order stuff setting in and young black people are being, um, programmed mm -hmm. for the a future of just perp walks, hands up, light yeah. you up. Those are things that cops say, hands up to young women, uh, light you up. Like they, you know, they, they made the reference to Sandra Bland. That's what the cops said to her. I'm going to light you up. Yeah. That's what cops say. And that doesn't mean I'm going to build you up. Light you up means you're going to get shot or tased, you know? Yep. So I just, it, you know, I understand they have, they have good outcomes because I read about the students that go to college, mm -hmm. but. Um, you can't you can't beat the black out of people culturally. The 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 culture the that comes from that has been created out of the circumstances of having to create a culture in a place that you were kidnapped to. This is not home. And you had to create your own culture through music and fashion and hairstyles and that is what we have. So you want to neuter us and take that away from us? That's not okay. Yeah, and it's interesting to hear the response from the, the charter school. It, it feels pretty weak. So this is coming from Ellen Metz, principal of Noble's flagship campus, Noble Street College Prep, says the network's guiding concept is that rules are grounded in purpose rather than power, saying some of the stuff that you're talking about, like the level zero for days and weeks, like, you know, we serve 12,000 families in Chicago. This would be headlines if this were happening on a regular basis. Families would be up in arms, all 12,000 of them, and they're just not. But 
that doesn't really seem sufficient to me. In, in fact, there, the NPR sort of enlightens us a little bit more, saying uh, Jane Sunday is a social psychologist who focuses on poverty, children, and education, says low-income families tend not to question systems like those at Noble. She points to a study by sociologist Melvin Cohn exploring how parenting styles vary by social class. What he found was that working-class parents focus very much on obedience. Off, little Johnny went to school, and his mom said, listen to the teacher, be good, be quiet, and the upper-class parents focused on learning and creativity and having fun. The working class parents train their children to be workers on an assembly line, not empowered, while the upper class families taught their children to believe that they had a legitimate right to their opinion and their views. And I think reading through that, it really resonates with what we're hearing uh, coming out of these schools. Right. But I would actually say it's the schools that train the child to be that way, to be the obedient or to be the quote unquote free thinker. I mean, this is this might sound kind of extreme, but this is really the worst expression of training children to enter the labor market or the prison system in really disciplinary ways. I mean, that's why they're regimenting their time so severely and charging them $140 for a, for a character development course if they um, have a certain number of demerits in a two-week period. So these kind of extreme measures mirror the way these students are going to be treating and probably at this point treated by the rest of the the, the, um, the, the rest of society and the rest of um, the government structures. So I think the other thing that I wanted to mention, because I'm just really focused in on how humiliating and horrific yeah. um, bleeding through your pants are when you're on your moon That's cycle. And I think we're so far behind as a nation when it comes to figuring out how to implement women's bodies mm -hmm. into our everyday lives. Yes. We're so, I mean, this, at this point, we should be coming up with innovative, creative solutions for the fact that these, these young girls are being introduced to this part of their bodies processing. And yet, what are we doing? We're making them feel even more ashamed and even more sickened by it. And I think this hits home as one of the students said, when you treat us like animals, what do you think we're going to act like? Absolutely. Yeah, I think the, the quotes from the students uh, and the teachers that work there particularly struck me. Uh, there was a student who actually excelled at one of these schools. Uh, he scored a 35 on his ACT, and he's now at Brown University. He actually turned down Harvard. He felt it was too snobby, and he even still said that the school felt like this is a quote, a prison, um, and that, that they would be searched for staff for unknown reasons. So I, I think that that sort of uh, tells you what you need to know about what's what's going on here. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking about uh, internalized Islamophobia, and then we're also going to be getting to uh, a story about Betsy DeVos. I totally forgot about that one, and hopefully we get to it, Facebook dating. So stay with us after the break. We talk about TYT Army being so strong, usually they help us run our show. Now they're going to help us run the country. Oh. It's time that we reclaim democracy for the people. We had a huge victory for Wolfpack. When Lincoln said this is a country by, of, and for, he said of the people, not of corporations. So our representatives don't represent us. Whoa! Democracy! We are! We are! Be among them. Well, with Wolfpack, the, the, the mission is so clear. Money is killing our democracy. 96% of Americans want it. When you get the power back, oh, that feels good. This is just the beginning. Just go get them, man. Up and at them. Knock, knock. We're coming for them! Wolfpack.com Patience. It's a virtue. They think you can put me in a box. But you can't stifle a revolution. Cenk Uger, you started something. An idea. The truth and honesty matter above all else. And the people love you for it. And for a while, so did I. We could have stood united. A political force of reckoning upon our foes, the hypocrites, the phonies, the unjust. You put me in this box. Jake. No. You began without me. You began without me. God as my witness. I will be the one to finish it. Thank <laughs> you. 
folks here we call the internet. There's a lot of bad folks out to get you. For years, corporate media barons and right wing rustlers tried to keep the status quo around these parts. But lucky for us, there's a man in this black sack. They call him Jack stories. Tim Klein Jr. says, that school sounds like a concentration camp. Ooh. Brian Newton says, uh, Ida called it. It's just another way to say assimilation to forced colonization and enslavement. Mm. Uh, Special Ed says, Trump's base let Jesus take the wheel and they're in the back seat asleep, have no idea what's going on. They're not going to know what's happening until they are going over a cliff. Mm. That's some imagery to take us into this next segment. Let's just jump right into it because I really do want to get to that Facebook dating app story. <laughs> and they're going to have to put up with me if we don't. So, uh, there's a newly released report by the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding that says that Muslims are internalizing Islamophobia and that the media is to blame. The study found that Muslims are more likely than members of other faiths to agree with the sentiment that their community is more, quote, prone to negative behavior than other people. Let's take a look at one of these graphics. So there you can see uh, the ISPU's third annual American Muslim poll surveyed Muslims, Jews, Catholics, Protestants, white evangelicals, and those who are non-affiliated and compared attitudes across the group. So what you're looking at now was in response to, I believe my faith community is more prone to negative behavior than other faith communities. Um, so you can see an overwhelming 30%. 30% coming uh, from the Muslim respondents to the survey. Uh, if you need a little bit of a brush up on what is uh, internalized racism, here you go. Internalizing racism involves ingesting often subconsciously acceptance of the dominant society stereotypes of one's ethnic group. Uh, what is the takeaway from this study? The ISP director of research says, quote, it's the combination of disproportionate media coverage and Muslims being much more focused on that kind of media coverage that explains the fact that Muslims themselves have internalized internalize this very stereotype of being prone to violence. The report also found that those who scored higher on the Islamophobia Index were associated with greater support for President Donald Trump's travel bans and increased surveillance of American mosques. So uh, a pretty, pretty startling uh, research. Were either of you surprised that this was coming out? So I actually have a report on this that I am in the middle of writing All right. uh, for Pop Culture Collaborative. It looks at over 100 years of representation of Muslims on TV and film. And it lines up exactly with the findings of the study, which is that there aren't available, quote unquote, positive or authentic full images of Muslims on television. Things are shifting now, but what we, ha we have had to ingest through political campaign ads, through primetime news, through movies like American Sniper or Argo was the degradation of our faith and of our communities. Mm -hmm. So it's hard not to, and I'll give you an anecdote or a, there, I have many anecdotes, but um, I run a lot of workshops nationally around representation of Arabs and Muslims on television and film. And I do a quick little activity in the beginning where I ask people to think about the images that they see or the things that come to mind when they hear the word terrorist, the things that come to mind when they hear the word Muslim, and the things that come to mind when they hear Arab. And usually what's consistent is that all the same adjectives are used for all three categories. And so I've had Muslims tell me afterwards, is it weird that I couldn't think of anything that wasn't terrorist-like for Muslim? Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's not, because think about the images that you're constantly being exposed to. 
And yes, you might have family structures and communities that are counter to what you're seeing, but it's so hard to displace the imagery around you. And uh, the thing that also was really striking is that intercepted the story, and shout out to Murtaza, who is an amazing reporter there, and they found that there was disproportionate coverage of violence perpetrated by Muslims seven times on television, seven times oh. more, and that Muslims received four times longer sentencing for the same crimes as non-Muslims. So that's, I mean... It's not, sadly, it's not surprising that they would view themselves in this way. And unfortunately, it's double the amount of every other religious community's understanding of themselves in a negative light. Yeah, it's Islam's turn as uh, it happens uh, with religion, with regard to history in this country and as well. I, listen, I went to Israel two years ago and I remember having dinner and one of my friends who was, a, she's a writer was sitting next to me and uh, she, she laughed at me cause I was like, I'm getting up and I'm leaving. This Palestinian man was sitting here telling me how bad Palestinians were and how hor horrible they've been to Israel who has been so good to them and that, um, you know, they need to learn. And I was just watching this, uh, personification of self hate to yeah. a degree that I couldn't even eat my food and I was she was she's Colombian and she was like oh, why does this upset you so much and I'm like my ex husband is Muslim my children were raised in a Muslim friendly home and um not just that I was like as a person of color self hate is something that you know resonates with me because it's so prevalent in all people of color because the the pictures of us are so bad that are constantly being depicted that we are all walking around trying to dispel the myths of our own people because we feel a responsibility to that while white people get to glide about around the planet just being white because they don't have to carry the weight of all white people right they don't have to carry the burden of representation yeah. and to see what the consequences are for that as well so i would just quickly add there was this interesting roundtable conversation with producers and showrunners with the new york times after trump's election and the showrunner for um quantico said that he wanted to stop doing terrorist terrorism plots after the election and the new york times reporter pointedly asked howard gordon from uh 24 and homeland if he felt like his shows contributed to the negative sentiments about muslims anti-muslim rhetoric and sentiments and he said yes wow and he was he also had kind of a coming to jesus moment as well but those folks are not just doing that for Trump's face, but as we were saying, people in, in my community are also feeling that way. And I'll just lastly add that it's hard because we carry that burden, and at the same time, we are horrified by the violence perpetrated to mostly our community by groups like Daesh, ISIL, or um, any group purporting to lead a Muslim quote-unquote caliphate or whatnot. But then we're also made to speak to it. And they're killing us in yeah. Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, and and in parts of West Africa. And so we're, I think we're just in such a, a rock and a hard place. It's hard to even think straight. Yeah, yeah we're just going to end on that. Thank you, Miss. That was really, uh, it was some, like, hearts all over the place. But we're going to try and... You know what? We're gonna go straight to the Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at the clock. I was like, No, no, not today. <laughs> we're, we were gonna talk about Betsy DeVos, but she's kind of a dummy, and I don't like her. And you're not surprised by that if you're watching the show. So let's get into uh, Facebook dating, so we can have a little levity uh, because news is hard, and it's a hard day. Uh, so. Facebook has announced that they will be showing a new dating feature and Match.com, the dating services, is getting clobbered in stocks already. So Facebook is launching a dating feature. CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced during the keynote address at Facebook's annual F8 Developer Conference on Tuesday. This is going to be for building real, long-term relationships not just hookups. Uh, the opt-in will feature match users specifically with people they aren't already friends with. Facebook users can build a dating profile which friends won't be able to see. Shares of the online dating company Match plunged as much as 20% uh, after this news broke. So what I would like to hear from you guys is how soon are we all going to sign up? Uh, I'm engaged. <laughs> Not very I soon. Know. But what about you guys? Is this something that you're interested in? Are you surprised? Do you think this is a strategic move for Facebook? I'm, oh, I'm, 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 I'
trust Facebook. <laughs> and exactly. like, really? It's trying to sell you quote unquote paid fake news ads and you want it to sell you a partner? Like, I'm just dumbfounded hey, by if, this. If I could convince you, Mayfa, Zuckerberg did say in his address that he will quote, keep building even while we focus on keeping people safe. So he says he can do both. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should trust him. I mean, him. Just, just think about the algorithms that have produced the kind of friends on your feed that you actually are not interested in their baby pictures. Like, I'm sorry. Like, there's some people I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I don't even remember who you are, but I'm seeing these celebration photos and you're part of my 20 people that I can only see from my 3,000 friends. Okay, great. Thanks, Facebook. I think it's also in part um, an effort to take away business from Tinder, which Tinder w links to Facebook profiles or Instagram profiles. And now I'm sure people at Facebook were like, Zuckerberg, also, why do we need them? Mm -hmm. We can just drive the business here and then we can populate more ads, sell more ad space, and we can do the work instead of outsourcing these profiles to other dating sites. Yeah, it's going to be interesting when they roll this out to see which demographics sign up for it because I know uh, people of my generation and younger aren't really using Facebook as their primary social media tool no. anymore. It's not by far, far. It's Instagram. It's Twitter. Um, I know that my mom and aunts have a good old time on Facebook, and that's great for them, but they're not really looking to date right now. Well, some of them might be, but like, they're, you know, I, I'm wondering who they're really going to be targeting and how they're going to do that. It seems like an app like a Tinder has done better than just, oh, and on Facebook you can date. And something that we were talking about as well uh, before we, we came on to talk about this story was, isn't Facebook already, already kind of a dating app? Yeah. Like, I know yeah. plenty of people that have met their significant others through Facebook or through Instagram. I mean, these social media platforms, they're already, you're already talking to each other. Yeah. You know what you're up to. You know what I was laughing at? My boyfriend was laughing because my DMs already are lit. Like, I'm sure. People are like, send these weird messages. Um, I gave him a password to my like page because he, he helps manage it. And somebody sent me a, a penis pic and uh, it was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable. Oh, wow. But I'm so glad I didn't have to see <laughs> it. Me from that, but uh, <laughs> this is how you know how guys are different with social media. Is because I'm sure he, as a straight guy, has probably never been sent a dick pic before. No, no. So he, he, you know, <laughs> you know, girls like we, I've been with friends before, I certainly have not received them, and that's not a challenge. <laughs> um, but like, I'm just, I've been with girls before, and you know, like my friend Darren, like when she gets sent like a photo, she'll it'll be like certain blurry, and then you can you, you like opt in a number of times before you see what it is, and you can get kind of a vague outline. Like, I don't know what you're up to. I don't want that. And so, obviously, your boyfriend has no idea. He's like, this is probably a compliment. I'll buy a lady. open all of it. <laughs> well, he yeah. doesn't because we, we, I get business there. The other thing that I thought was interesting was that they said they're not going to match you with the people who are your mm -hmm. friends. So, do you really want to be matched with the people who aren't your friends on Facebook? Like, your local, you know, Trump supporter, if you were a Hillary or a Bernie bro, like, who are they going to match you with? Like, the people who are, I mean, I know that there are billions of yeah. people on Facebook now, but that's just scary that it's like someone that's not even in your realm. Like, I don't know, because I feel like with dating apps, you have a little bit of control yeah. of the geographic setting and the you know they're they what is it uh one of them has like a 17 page questionnaire i don't I mean, oh yeah okay cupid has like a long one of them there yeah yeah so i wonder how they're gonna roll that out i think it might be more effective if they went into your friends because i don't know about you guys i've had facebook for so long i have so many people i don't talk to if they went into your friends they did a little data mining which we know yeah. through cambridge analytica they're super comfortable <laughs> with yeah. they data mined that and they were like hey take a look at sarah Take a look at, you haven't really seen, she might be open to it. Yeah. Like, she could be a thing. You know, why not people that you already know that maybe you've never considered before, yeah. you could look at this fictional Sarah in yeah. a whole new light. You guys both like food trucks. You both like <laughs> food trucks. You got you got food 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 truck. tattoos, lesbians, yes. dogs. Like, come on. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I think that I would be more interested in. So you guys will not be signing up. No. Uh, yeah, that's not happening. Do How many times do we need to say, that still doesn't have clean water? <laughs> I don't want to know Facebook app. All right, so we have we have two minutes. We have two minutes left. Is there anything that you guys would like to plug? Because I'm certainly not going to talk about Betsy DeVos. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for honoring the fact that when we sometimes put them in the limelight, then it just gives them a lot more um, uh, credence. 
and it went exactly how I thought it was going to go. It yeah, was, it was exactly. It was no surprise. Yeah. It was, it was no absolutely no surprise. And I know, whatever. Uh, I'm at the Hollywood Improv on Thursday Yay! at the lab at 7.30 if you want to come see okay. someone. That. I think I want to. Actually. Wait, this Thursday? Thursday? Yeah, and Hollywood then this Improv? weekend I'm at the Youngstown, Ohio Comedy Festival headlining one of the shows. So if you're in Youngstown, Ohio, come see me. Um, I, this is exciting. Um, the United States of Women, I'm going to be spitting some poetry and I'm going to be on a panel. So all weekend I'm there and I'm going to be talking to people about how to feel free in your bodies. There's an event at the California African American Museum on May 6th where we're going to pitch a little about the work we do. And then on Monday, if you're in Los Angeles and you have my little promo code, you can come to this yoga breath work really cool workshop that I'm doing with this uh, company called Brandless um, and the promo code's called HOST2018. So um, I am so impressed yeah, that you well, remembered that. Uh, <laughs> I don't really have anything to plug, but I am going to read some tweets just to take us out of this. Uh, so uh, let's see if we have any more tweets. We do not, so I am <laughs> not going to be reading Should we just make up tweets, tweets, like things so, that we're going to tweet out to folks? <laughs> yeah, what I would like to say is, um, how, how's it, how are you guys doing? It's been good to be back on the main show. I think we can all agree that your girl is nailing it after taking a break for the past couple of months, and no one would ever say that I ended too early and that I'm just, <laughs> you know, uh, just uh. dancing around here. No one could possibly say that. I'm going to check again for tweets because I'm a... <laughs> I think I'd, no, 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 no. Cool. I think you did an amazing oh, job. Oh, May 7th, my radio show. There we go. My okay. radio show kicks off. True Serum on the dash. I, I wish I could give, like, a Murder with Friends update. Oh, no, I can, I can I keep have, plugging stuff that I'm know. doing. Okay, do you want me to keep doing. going? I, yeah, we okay, have about, like, like, 20, 30 seconds of okay, plugs. Perfect. Okay, so actually for... Thanks. Thanks for the... <laughs> your thanks for the coach. Yeah. Um, so uh, the start of Ramadan, which is about like May 15th or 16th, we're going to do this Muslim bailout campaign that was inspired by the Black Mamas bailout from uh, last year. And so look out for that. It's called Believer's Bailout. Okay, awesome. And that has been the second hour. You're all beautiful. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
This is just somebody who's really rich trying to buy an election. We all know that the problem with our politics right now is that it's been bought and sold by millionaires and billionaires and by corporations, and he is exactly that. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. It matters the body of work that you put together in your career. And I know uh, that somebody who is has videos on YouTube showing off his house, uh, multiple thousand square foot house with uh, you know seven different fireplaces, um, is not somebody I'd call progressive. And certainly the work that he did uh, to make his money doesn't seem very progressive. The fact that he's conned people left and right and is now uh, spending a lot of money in his own race trying to buy an election. That is politics as usual to me. It is not the progressivism that people like you and I espouse. And when you compare that to my body of work, the fact that I chose not to go into clinical medicine because I didn't want to be a part of that system and instead decided to spend my time rebuilding a health department in the poorest city in America, I think the difference is clear. I, um, I'm not in a position to judge people's hearts, but I will say that you can judge his background and you can judge what he's trying to do in this race, and it's pretty clear that's not the progressive that you and progressivism that you and I believe in. Yeah, you know, you've got something unique in your resume. So you've got all the things that you mentioned, and you're a Rhodes Scholar and all those wonderful things, but you built a program to give school children uh, in the city glasses. Yeah, I mean, how did that even occur to you? So I'll tell you, Jake, I, I was... Um, We'll just say I wasn't the best student growing up. And one of the reasons why is because I used to get real bored in the classroom. And when I got bored, I used to try and entertain myself, usually, unfortunately, at the expense of, of my teachers and sometimes my classmates. And I can't imagine what it would have been like if I couldn't even see the board. Now, that's the case in, in, in Detroit. 30% of the kids who we would test and know they needed glasses would come back testing positive again ne the next year. That means they spent an entire year without the ability to see the board. Now, there's pretty astounding statistics that show that the probability among general people of needing a pair of glasses is about one in five. If you look at young people associated with the juvenile justice system, that goes to about four in five. And that difference tells us a lot about that axis of being a kid who can't see the board and then needing to entertain yourself soon enough, you're being labeled a bad kid. And when you're labeled a bad kid, you then act like the bad kid. And that path changes substantially. Imagine what can happen in terms of interrupting that by just giving a kid a pair of glasses so that that kid can see the board, learn what's happening on the board, and be their best student. And when we found those statistics in Detroit, that 30% of our kids wouldn't get a pair of glasses, even though we had tested them and knew they needed a pair, we knew we needed to do something. And so we built this program from the ground up. In two years, first two years of its operations, delivered over 7,000 pairs of glasses. And I'll tell you, uh, in my life, there are a few moments that have moved me as much as being able to put the first pair of glasses on a child and then see that kid look at his hand and say, I, I didn't know that there were wrinkles in my hand. And um, and that moves you, right? And that's something that we could do in, across the state of Michigan for all kids, right? In fact, the program that we built is revenue neutral. Um, it's fully paid for by Medicaid. And so these are opportunities for us to think outside the box about what government does to be able to provide real benefits for the people that we serve. Uh, yeah, Abdul, I see why people are excited about you now. <laughs> okay, that's, I would not have uh, thought of that program, and, and I did not know those stats, uh, and now, ironically, I can see. Um, so, uh, you say that if you win the, the governorship, that you are going to try to do state-level single-payer health care. All right, well, talk to me about how you would do that, because that's, that's yeah. not easy at the state level. You're right, but let's let's pay attention to the history of how it happened in Canada, right? In Canada, um, it didn't just single payer didn't come to Canada all of a sudden after World War II. Instead, what happens is people realized that uh, GIs were coming home; they didn't have access to the healthcare that they needed, and province by province decided that they needed a province level level uh, health insurance program that benefited everybody. So, if we use that model in Michigan. What it tells us is that state-level action is probably the best place to start. Now, here's the thing. You know this better than me, Cheng. We spend 19 cents on the dollar of every dollar spent in our health in our, in our entire economy on health care. It's way too expensive. But not only that, in places like Michigan and across the country, frankly, you've got people who are paying huge amounts in things like prescription drugs because it's currently illegal for Medicare, which is the single biggest buyer of health care, in the United States and among the biggest in the world to negotiate the price of prescription drugs. And in Michigan in particular, we've got an issue with auto insurance because we ask auto insurance to be health insurance. These are all problems that Michiganders pay for every day. And the usual experience for even somebody who's insured in the system is that if they get sick or they have to go see a doctor or a hospital, they're going to have to negotiate with an insurance company that's making 15 cents on the dollar for every dollar that they pay into their health care services. 
that they're going to have to negotiate just to get the care they already paid for. Nobody likes the system as it stands. We have an opportunity at the state level to say, well, listen, we can bring down the costs in particular over time, but immediately by eliminating the overhead costs of insurance, eliminating the 15 cents on the dollar in profits that insurance currently makes off the top. In doing that, we create a, a single payer system for the state of Michigan. We then can start negotiating with pharmaceuticals to bring down the cost of prescription drugs across Michigan. And because we have universal health care that covers the 600,000 Michiganders who currently go without health care every single day, because we can cover them, we can bring down the cost of auto insurance because we're not asking it to be health insurance anymore. The payouts for every single Michigander is that the money that they spend in paying for health care goes down. Every Michigander has better health care, and we're able to do things like incentivize uh, prevention in a system where we know that the payoff in the back end saves the state money. It's a win for everybody. The only people who don't like it are, of course, the hospital association and the insurers, because right now they make a ton of money gaming a system where they can collude together to raise the prices on all of us and keep people who don't have health care out of the system. And they're going to spend a lot of money to try to defeat you in the general election. Uh, <laughs> so I, I know that you, you don't take corporate PAC money, otherwise just Democrats wouldn't have endorsed you. And, and I know you, you say you want to get money out of politics. I want to get a little bit more specific than that, because it's obvious that you're uh, intimately familiar with a lot of these policy issues. So um, in the case of getting money out of politics, would you support a, a state, uh, your state legislature as a governor, you couldn't do anything about it other than support it, but uh, to call for a, a, a convention to call for a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics? I would love to do that. <clears throat> and if I can come in and uh, we can bring with us a, a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to ask those questions. I'd love to see that. I mean, right now, Michigan actually has a program that we're benefiting from, where when we run against self-funders like the individual uh, that you brought up earlier, that there's a million dollars in uh, matching funds for every contribution from a Michigan resident under $100. And we get a two-to-one match from the state. And I think that's a pretty great program. I would love to see a system kind of like the UK's where these uh, races are actually fully publicly funded and that we get corporate money entirely out of, uh, out of the system. Let's be clear, though. Federal law right now and the interpretation of Citizens United uh, makes it so that we have declared completely erroneously that uh, corporations are people and that their speech in the form of money is protected. And so we would have to stand up and fight Citizens United at the federal level if any sort of state policy is going to hold. And so I'd love to be able to move at the state level, but let's be clear, we're going to have to deal with this at the federal level because we're obviously preempted by federal law. And so this is something that I think we need coordination from states uh, and, and the federal government to work on. I'll tell you this, though. One of the biggest challenges that we have right now is that a number of state legislatures uh, are currently Republican. They're pretty close from being able to have uh, the ability to pass uh, U.S. constitutional amendments. And um, our responsibility to be able to bring strong progressive leadership to Michigan uh, really does have ramifications at the federal level. Yeah, well, an Article 5 convention would allow for the states to, to uh, basically get around uh, Washington to propose an amendment. So uh, let's hope that uh, Michigan is uh, headed down that path. Uh, all right, I, I want to let uh, everybody know what the links are here. A bill for Michigan dot com uh, is the website, uh, and then you've got the volunteer and the donation links there as well. And the links will be down below on YouTube and Facebook the description box if you're watching on those platforms. Abdul Al Said run, running for governor in Michigan, and obviously uh, has got his stuff together and is clearly progressive. Uh, so. Um, Good luck in the race, and uh, we hope to talk to you in the general. I look forward to it. It'll be a lot of fun, and uh, let's go take back our politics. Exactly. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to make one uh, note for you guys. I had nothing to do with picking up the little site. I, I didn't know about him until uh, I, I read into him. Uh, just Democrats found him, picked him, etc. cetera, uh, after I left the organization, and and I, I got a call saying, man, you got to check this guy out. And you know me, I got a perspective. Uh, and then I read Zed Jelani's piece about his opponent who went and uh, talked to Republican and Democratic consultants to try to figure out uh, where he would have a better chance of winning. That sounds pretty much like a fraud. So uh, 
if you want a real progressive, if, if you want a real progressive Michigan, if you're watching Rebel Headquarters, you probably do. It looks like Abdul El Said is the guy, and uh, man, that guy looks like he's got his stuff together. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break here. we got another candidate for you guys when we come back.
think it's no. going in. Yeah. Right? Yes. And the Sixers were having a matchup problem because they wound up with their point guard on him. And their point guard's seven feet tall. Yeah. And Ben Simmons was having a little bit of a hard time yeah. staying with it. Yeah, and I said I said that for this series for Ben, uh, last series he was able to switch yep. and relax. Mm. He can't switch and relax in the series because when you switch, you are awkward. Are you on Baines who's been aggressive on the glass? Then if you go a, a, a smaller point, a smaller pick and roll, then you're on Jason Tatum. So he has to guard a lot this series. So they got to make a lot of adjustments on defense because that was a big problem yesterday. Okay. Go ahead. And do, doesn't Jason Tatum look like a star? Yeah. And, and I'm just seeing a young, rising yes. star, right? You're growing up. Growing up right like, before you know, your very eyes? He's looking good. And, you know, you got to give a lot of credit to the coach right. because to give – these young kids, the confidence they, they have to play like they plan in the playoffs in their first year in the league, that says a lot for that coach because a lot of times kids are not too confident in, the, in these situations. You know, look at look at Philly. They, they're a great three-point shoot, three shooting team, but in the playoffs, it's harder. Right. There's no shots are harder. They well, can't make them on the road. And I'm starting to wonder, because they had these avalanche halves they throw down on yes. people where they'd go 80 points. Seven, remember, they put 78 on LeBron that yeah. Friday yeah. night at the end of the year. Yeah. Well, they're just bombing threes. Bellinelli and Ilyasova Il come in and just, just they're like without conscience. They're just firing from everywhere. All of a sudden, you have a night where you're up against the number one team against the three. Defending the three is Boston. And you shoot 19%. Maybe that's no coincidence. Yeah, not at home. Huh? And the thing is, the Sixers are a very good defensive team, Skip. They gave a three-quarters to 30 points or more. You're not winning like that. You give in the playoffs. You give up three quarters of thirty points or more. Oh, you lose in that game, mm -hmm. and you allow them to shoot forty eight percent from the field, forty nine percent from the three point line. How you gonna beat them? But I tell you what, Skip, they're all this, uh, Danny and you say, go ahead, keep all the road here, because he ain't gonna be having to be sitting like Kyrie wanting to do his own thing. What you think, Rose? You're gonna want to go back to the bench wow. after the way he played in the playoffs. Somebody gonna want him to run their squad. Unless you play them together in stretches. I don't know. You could. Everybody can't play. Because what you going to do with Al? Okay, Al Horford, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Gordon Hayward, Marcus Smart. Everybody can't play. Kyrie. I think you're describing an Eastern Conference championship team. I think you are. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. When they're whole and healthy, I think whoa, you just whoa, described whoa, it. Whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, Kyrie isn't there. Gordon Hayward is no, there. I'm just talking about in the future. Yeah. We're going to talk. We're, we're talking about. I'm just saying how things look like it's going to unfold. Mm. But as long as that old big guy, that old big guy to be wet, boy, who he blow hard down. He does he? <sighs> Freeze up everything. Mr. Jackson, you realize he picked the Raptors to win Game One against LeBron James. Yes, game One, he did. Wow. wow. Sold them out. Did you say that publicly? Jumped right off the bandwagon. No, 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 no. Yeah, this ain't no bandwagon. What I, what, what, what we, me and Ron doing? This ain't no bandwagon. Mm -hmm. I've been down from jump. Yeah, well, you just jumped off. So you're down with Ron and not the Cavs. Yeah, I'm down with the Cavs too, but I don't think they're gonna because they, they just had a long fall series. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't, you know, hey, they could prove me wrong because uh, uh, the Celtics had a hard fall series. No, they can But the difference is the Celtics are at home and the Cavs are on the road. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, look. They still the baby dinosaurs. We got them. Ah. We don't got them tonight. Well, I just hope the Sixers got these guys because Game Two looms as not not do or die, not must win, but, but you better win Game Two or they, you're going to be in some. Trouble. No, 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 no. They got to slow the game down. No. They got to slow that game down and make it a half court game. Yeah, because you those big can't keep up. Joel and beat look is great if he'll skip. He's not getting up and down. Ela Soul is not getting up and down. So that's not what they do. Yeah, they make threes, but you better play to your strength. Let me, let uh, uh, Embiid have 40 and 20. Let Simmons have, you know, 20 and 10. Try to get up and down with them threes and you miss them. How about let Jalen Brown come back and play in yeah. game two? Now what? That'll be a problem. Hey, don't worry about it. He said, Joel Embiid said, we all play like, mm -hmm. but we'll be better on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Skip. Mm -hmm. Don't be surprised if your boy, uh, Brett Brown, got on the phone with Greg Popovich. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you see, Pop. Probably did. Probably did. Well, you see, Braun, see, Braun ain't got nobody he called like that. Braun just go back in that lab himself. Said, oh, that's what y'all want to do. Oh, y'all want to stay home. So I just punished Boogie. Huh? I just punished Lance Steve. So did you I just, just punish Matt if you know? LeBron James is the head coach of the Cavaliers? No, I'm just saying. I, I, I just said, said that. Hold on. He said Brent Brown would call Greg Popovich. Mm -hmm. Greg Popovich doesn't coach the Sixers. LeBron went back in the lab. You didn't say Ty Lue goes back in the lab. LeBron, LeBron I need a quarterback. He was I clear after the, the game the other day. LeBron dictated the, the starting lineup. When the Patriots are on the field and they have the ball, who's the coach? 
when the Patriots have the ball. I never said Tom Brady was the head coach. He is. If he was, Bill Belichick would be gone. No, no, no. no. <laughs> but, but the problem is LeBron in that lab, he got an Abraham to cooking that thing up all day long. Yeah, y'all staying home. With well, look, you could listen to LeBron after the game the other day. It was clear he dictated that starting lineup. He said, we win with the players who had done That's what you got to do. So he told Ty, here's who we're going to start That's today. You, 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 you. Been there, done that. That's how you went to the finals the first time. Yeah. Took four guys. Hey, guy valeted him. Come on, you can play. <laughs> guy picked, brought his grocery. You can play. Really? Pizza guy. Come on. Went to the finals and we get. Were then, you on that team? Oh, no. Oh, no. Not yet. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's what he did. He's a young man. No, 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 no. He was that was way before. Oh, no, 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 no. That was he was before he. He was before. 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 Old Tiger. Yeah. Old Tiger. That was a good day. That's a good day. Good day. For you you, you know. can't get old Tiger. got padded. Padded feet. Can't well. creep it. I don't know if that Tiger has uh, padded feet. Oh, yeah, yeah. They put it in here creeping. Did you see Steph Curry and LeBron were there? They were born in the same hospital. Same hospital. Same hospital. Same hospital. Yeah. Yeah, same hospital. Same hospital. Yeah. Who's born, uh, born on your birthday? I think Jeter. Yeah. I think Jeter. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. I thought you were going to say Jesus. Yeah. Oh, he's about to be here. 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 I know. No, no. Hey, uh, the challenge, they, didn't keep, they didn't have dates back in that time, Skip. You know, they, you know so it could have happened. Could have happened. As far as I know it. At Metro PCS, we're so sure you'll love our network. We let you try it free for two months. Wait, you said two free months? Yeah. Switch and get two months of unlimited data free on a network that covers 99% of people in the U.S. Try us. You'll love it. Mm. it you know, so it could have happened. <laughs> could have happened. As far as I know. We got it there. Steven, thanks for joining us. No mercy. The Raptors are a six and a half point favorite in game one tonight against the Cavs. LeBron is coming off a huge 45 point performance against the Pacers in game seven on Sunday. But after the game, he said he was, quote, burnt and tired. Cleveland has won six straight playoff games against Toronto. We're joined by FS1 NBA analyst Jim Jackson. <laughs> what was that for, Jim? Mm, interesting. Can't wait to hear what your take is on this because I know my partner's take on this. Who wins game one? Is that realistic? Huh? Yeah. Oh, he's being really scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harshly I think, I think he's a little scared. Yeah. He's being scary right now. Who wins game <laughs> one and the series, Jim? Uh, this is a different anomaly here for the Cavs. I think coming off a tough game seven, which in the first round there, a LeBron James team is not accustomed to. I just think there's going to be too much energy in the building and a quick turnaround mm -hmm. for the Cavs coming in mm -hmm. for that reason. I think, too, also – the mental fatigue of going through that game seven against Indiana. Not only just the team, but I think LeBron. Mm -hmm. See, this is one of those games where LeBron comes out and he's trying to get people involved early. You know, knowing that they have game two, but trying to get guys involved because mm -hmm. it's just, this is a different this is a different kind of climb. And I think they're still trying to figure out the cast what what's the best lineup. This is a different cool group they're going to have to go with against this Toronto team compared to Indiana. I don't know if they can start the same, start the five, just because of Kyle Lowry. Right. There's a lot different than Kyle Lowry. You may have to bring in George Hill or Calderon just to be able to match up with Kyle Lowry because he's looking to score a lot more than Kyle Lowry. But I give Toronto the edge in this first game because the energy, they're at home, the mental fatigue of Cleveland in that, seven, in that, in that last game against Indiana. Sure. What? I mean, so now you feel better? No, no. I, I mean, he's just echoing some of the things that yeah. I said. Huh. But think about this. How many times you know, Skip, in a game seven, a team will start an entirely different lineup? A lineup they hadn't played, basically played all year long. And that's what Ty Lue did in a game seven. Because you know why? He had that old big joker. You ever play spades? You know when you <laughs> got that big spades. joker? See, Skip, I, I don't want to hear about the big joker because you have already picked no. the Raptors to win one. game one. So one game. stick with it. One game. Yeah. One. I said one game. The big joker is going to lose uh, Shannon Sharp or less Shannon Sharp. Skip, if, I got the, if I got no. If I got the big joker and you got a bunch of spades, you might win you might win that hand. Uh. But 
We get the one fifth. Yeah, 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 the one fifth. Yeah, what I'm saying. That's the first one. <laughs> it's the first one to four. Mm-hmm. Now, even though Indiana got the one first, got they the one first, and they were yeah. to the four. Yeah. You and I both know deep down. I mean, you knew they were gonna win. Had you out there on, on that brand. I thing. thought it was gonna go seven, and it did. Yeah. And it got a little. I, you, know what, you know what? I, I needed to go seven because I needed to, to enhance LeBron's legacy. The, the game seven, who scored the most points in game seven, Skip? Who scored the most points in elimination game, Skip? So I, that's what I needed to happen. You don't know I walked into that corner. Mm. They're going to lose game one, but they'll be just fine on Thursday mm. night. I say they will win game one, and I will offer Mr. Jackson the same bet that I Offer to Mr. Oh. Sharp that he rejected, okay. which is I will take Cleveland plus the, the point spread. I'll take six it? and a half. I'll take the Cavs plus six and a half tonight don't at Toronto it. in Game One. He jank, come on, he jank, he's, he's trying to jank. He's trying to. I don't, I don't usually do numbers. I just do straight up. Straight up. Yeah, I do straight up. I got six and a half. That's what the points. No, no, is. no. Yeah, good point. I, I'll, I'll go straight up with you. No, I'll take six and a half because I'll take it straight up. Say six and well, a half. Forget the odds. I'm offering both of you. Like you tell me. Well, who cares what the odds? I'm gonna go with you. Yeah. I'm we can just go straight up on the I, first I game. I got Cleveland. Okay, I got Toronto. Okay, will you bet me? No, you don't <laughs> bet against LeBron. <laughs> huh? Why you? Why, why you want to bet? Because I don't. So you pick against him, but you won't bet against. No, him. no, no, no. Why no, not? No, What's no, the no, difference? No, because it's, it's, it's bad luck. It's sacrilegious. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like you don't wear shorts to church. Mm. I don't know. Out here, here you walk. Walk. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what church and where you live, Chad. <laughs> the church I go to, Westwood, they, they wear shorts. Uh, I don't know. Well, the rest of us, my grandma roll over. If you want, gee, you can you, you know, back down south, you better come dress your back. You know, to, to answer your question, though, overall, though, this is a this is a different Cavs team. Yes, as we know, going against the Raptors, you don't have that second place. But what I, I just kind of just went back and looked at a couple of numbers just historically, going back a year. What Cleveland has been able to do defensively against Toronto, in particular J.R. Smith guarding DeRozan, I think has been impactful. You go back to earlier this year, um, during the course of the year, DeRozan is averaging 23 points. Huh? But against the but, three but, games. But Cleveland won two out of three. Yeah, and and uh-huh. when his numbers have, have dipped down to 17. Last year in the playoffs, he averaged 27. During the course of the regular season, only 20 in the playoffs. They figure out a way to take out one of those guys. Right. Okay, because that's what you need. Now Toronto is built a little bit differently, yeah. but I think because LeBron put so much pressure that guys have to perform, those two have to be on point, on target the whole series in order to beat Cleveland for seven games. The ancillary players, yes, the bench is outperforming Cleveland in the playoffs. Yeah, I get so it. far, so far, so far. Watch but, what happens now. But I, I, I say this: one, those two have to step up. But I think for Cleveland, it's George Hill for me. I think George Hill can provide this Cleveland team with a different push. He's been successful playing against Toronto in the past, especially this year, averaging about 19 in the two games that he's played. Now, one was with Sacramento. But he can give you defensively. He's long, he's athletic, but also the ability for him to force Law where he have to guard him, maybe pick up a foul or two, right. to be able to finish at the rim like we saw in that third quarter and yeah. fourth quarter against Indiana. I think the key with Cleveland, too, is can George Hill bring that – for seven games. I'm going to remind you, I'm not the biggest George Hill fan, but he's played in a whole bunch of big games for mm-hmm. San Antonio Spurs. So he's been here. He hasn't been here with the big joker. Right. And it's a different feel, right. a different stage. But did he not come to play on Sunday? Yeah. yeah. He, uh-huh. they, they, they needed every bit of his eight, nine points that he gave them. But here's the thing that really no one talks about. Everybody talks about LeBron James and how, you know, how do you guard him? Because he, what LeBron also does, he forces your star to elevate their play. And what happens to those two Toronto stars? They shrink at the sight of the beast of the East. Because, they do. Every because time. with LeBron, if, if, if Kevin Durant doesn't play out of his mind like he played last year, mm-hmm. they're not beating the Cavs. He had to go, because LeBron was 32 triple-double, he had to go 35-8 and eight, along with Steph Curry's 29-9-8. and eight. Mm. So he, LeBron is going to force Lowry and DeRozan. you got to match him. You worry about stopping him. Have they ever? Did they last year? They got swept. This is a different team. I like this team. It's deep. No, you don't. It's deeper. No, you don't. It's much deeper. Yeah, the Raptors are much deeper. They go 9, 10 deep. Uh, Dwayne Case, they have no problem playing those guys 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. But how effective can they be? I mean, it goes deep. I, I get it. This is a different team. But depth only helps you if it works. 
And, and again, I, I say this about this Cleveland team is that they figure out ways to take some things out. And really, to be honest with you, it's not a big drop-off in regards to Kyle Lowry's numbers versus the Cavs. His shooting percentage is tweaked, but the bigger drop-off is with the Rose. Mm-hmm. That's where that, that, right. that yeah. you see, that's where that number is at. And, and you just, and, and that's a point you make because people don't understand that when you play against LeBron, that superstar on that other team, has to be. You got a match special. You got a match, you know, and that's for seven games. Right. You're not talking about two. Oladipo matched him three times, yeah. and he failed to match him four, four times. times. Yep. Right? You know, the court, in the football skip is like where well, the quarterback doesn't play. But if Nick Foles doesn't match somewhat Tom Brady's numbers, they're not winning. So you actually have to match the other guy. With, you, yeah, you don't defense him. You can't sack him. You can't intercept him. But you better match his level of play. Well, when LeBron James, you play LeBron James, you're a superstar. You better match your level of play. The blueprint is about to change because Toronto will send multiple bodies at LeBron in ways that Indiana never did. Right. Indiana said, we'll single cover you with Bogdanovich. And you can shoot layups all you want to because we're going to stay with all your shooters and we're going to make you just flat out. If you score 50, that's fine. But we're not going to let these other guys beat us. Right. And finally, Kevin Love did beat them in that stretch without LeBron in Game 7. So tonight, all the shooters are going to get shots they weren't getting against Indiana. Watch. They got some shots, but what about the ones they were missing? Well, that's what I'm counting. I ain't counting. But here's the thing, though. If they do that skip, this is and this is where it's important, too. Tristan Thompson, his activity. Mm-hmm. If they're going to send two at LeBron, that means you're going to have a mismatch on the backside. And if you're going to have that activity of Tristan Thompson, he's going to give Cleveland extra possessions yeah. because he's going to keep the ball alive. Well, it's pick and choose your points. To me, I don't want to give life, especially in game one, to the Cleveland Cavs ancillary player. I just don't. You're on the road, I don't want them to see the ball to go in. If LeBron is going to beat me, he's going to beat me. He'll beat me straight up. But I don't want to give, um, I don't want to give George Hill shots. I don't want to give Corver shots. I don't want to give Smith shots. And I darn sure don't want to see Tristan Thompson feeling good about himself. Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, like yeah, he knows yeah, yeah, a lot about extra. Mm. <laughs> you can't. Oh, I, 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 you can't. I'm not doing Joe. I didn't do nothing. See, you're talking about the gum, right? Yeah, I'm saying yeah. he gonna, you know, skip with like the more compensated by that. No, sport. you want to get into another <laughs> line no, of work? No, the <laughs> thing is, look, skip. See, skip trying to be slick. I know what he's trying to do. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just telling you what I see. No, you trying to make you trying to make me give give you a bet. Go ahead. No, I'm not. I'll take six and a half right here. You know good and well. Tristan Thompson's game was an anomaly in Game Seven. Fifteen and ten, he was sick. Gave him that. a chance, and he seized it. Did he not? Okay, what happened early in the season? He was having some issues. <laughs> he was distracted. <laughs> oh, you can't, you can't help yourself. You can't help yourself. Oh, so now you work for Page Six? Huh? No, now you work for TMZ. <laughs> you should be in the TMZ session. <laughs> no, you. You want to talk about he was distracted? Well, I just. What was he distracted right. from, Skip? I don't uh, know. I, you asked me a question, I answered. Okay, I did well, not he, volunteer it. What was he yeah. distracted? We'll from? leave it there, Jim. Thanks for joining us. No mercy. Thanks for listening to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm Joy Taylor. We're back at the same time tomorrow morning, 9:30 Eastern. We'll see you then. Bye.